Hit it. It's June 19, 2020, episode 85. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we interview Brad Dunkley from Warthaw Advisors, where we have a wide-ranging, fantastic discussion about his journey into one of Canada's largest hedge fund managers. Then we have a special guest appearance from Nathan Tankus, who does a deep dive into the controversial Atlantic article, Will the Banks Collapse? Nathan doesn't think so. Finally, Patrick will regale us with his technical mumbo-jumbo in the Talking <laughs> Charts segment. Then uh, this week in trading history, we go back to the Battle of Waterloo. Then we get Taylor to jump on here to, to share the WTF clip of the week. And then we cap it all off with the top three things to watch next week. And Kevin, we might even drink some beers along the way. So uh, stick around, everyone. We've got a great show. Let's get to our first guest. Brad Dunkley is co-founder and chief investment officer of Warthog Capital Advisors. Brad started his career at the venerable Canadian investment firm of Gluskin Chef, where he learned his craft under the legendary tutelage of Ira Gluskin. Warthog manages over $1.7 billion in assets and employs a team of over 44 experienced professionals. Welcome to the show, Brad. Well, uh, thanks, Kevin. Glad to be here. So this is something I've been looking forward to a long time, and I have to kind of confess to something. Um, for a little while, I was working for an allocator, and I used to go and we used to meet with different hedge funds. And I would always, one of the questions I'd ask at the end when we were walking, you know, walking away, I'd always say, what other, what one of your competitors impress you? I was always curious to see who basically these hedge funds would recommend. And I must say time and time again, the number of times that I heard you should really go and talk to those guys at Warta. I just happened all the time, and it's a pleasure to have you on. Well, it's, that's great feedback to hear. Um, you know, we, you know, we we stick to what we we know, and uh, we've done a pretty good job, I think. So, well, so let's get to know you a little bit more. Um, you know, you're a fellow Canadian, so some of our American listeners might not know these different places and stuff. But uh, w as we were chatting, we found out that you uh, grew up in the town right next to where Patrick grew up, and you guys are sworn mortal enemies. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like it's like U.S. and Canada. Canadians spend a lot of time thinking about Americans. Uh, <laughs> Americans don't spend that much time thinking about Canadians. Well, it's the same thing where I'm from. I'm from Aurelia. And Aurelia pre World War II was bigger than Barry, and uh, it was you know we were rivals in all kinds of sports. And uh, of course, Barry's this medium-sized city now. Aurelia hasn't grown much, and so everyone from Aurelia kind of doesn't like Barry, and Barry doesn't know that Aurelia exists. So that's kind of the relationship. <laughs> so how did a kid from Aurelia get all the way to to running a large hedge fund? Well, um, I thought you were going to ask me that so i actually spent a lot of time thinking about that and i actually it was fun to do that to go down memory lane and and think about uh, how i got here and uh the people that made it possible along the way um, and you know first first the uh, story begins actually at, my mother was uh, was an entrepreneur she had uh, started a uh, convenience store in downtown aurelia when i was about 10 years old and i was just old enough then that i was you know, included in that, I, it was, you know, I, I remember when my mom got her business registration, I helped her paint the store when it opened. Um, my first job was working for her, uh, filling the pop coolers. Uh, and I still can't get that smell of the, the, the pop cans leaking in that one back room. It's a sweet, disgusting smell, but that was, that was my first job. And, uh, uh, my grandfather, her father, um, uh, owned a sign shop, and my dad and lots of my uncles worked there. So I had these two entrepreneurial influences in my life um, that really set the first uh, interaction I had with, call it the business world. Um, and um, uh, and I do have to admit that I've always been attracted to the idea of of making money, um, and um, uh, I, especially the idea of of sending money into the future. And uh, when I was a kid, as most kids in, in Aurelia and Barry did, I used to get the pop bottles and take them to the, the, the nearest store, uh, and I was allowed to spend the money. And I used to buy hockey cards, and I, I did that for a couple of couple of years and chewed the gum and kept the cards. And um, I remember there was a TV show on in the 80s. It was called Heart to Heart. And oh, yeah, it was about, when they you met, remember that? When they met, it was, yeah, when they met, it was murder. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a husband and wife, and they go around solving murder mysteries. And I don't know if you remember it, but there was one episode where somebody passed away, and they left this kid with a suitcase 
filled with baseball cards, like Mickey Mantle oh. rookies and, and this sort of stuff. And um, it turned out it was worth like a quarter of a million dollars back in 1982 dollars. And I watched this episode and I was like, oh my God, these hockey cards of mine, they could be worth a lot of money one day. And so um, it was either that night or the next day, and it sounds very nerdy, I know, to admit this, but I actually took my hockey cards and I put them in piles of each team. And then I put the stack of cards onto a sheet of paper, folded it up, and I wrapped masking tape around it and wrote the name of the team on the outside. And then I stacked them up inside this cooler bag and I, I put it in my closet. And um, it almost looked like uh, cash, like on that Ozark show on Netflix, right? And just stacked it <laughs> in my closet. And um, I, I kind of forgot about them. And then um, I guess it was around 1990 or 1991, my town, my hometown got its first card store. It was called Stewart's Card Kingdom. And I went in there with a friend. And, and again, this is what, this is like eight, nine years later, which is like a whole other lifetime when you, it's double my age at that point. Um, and um, I see all these hockey cards that I recognize and, you know, some are worth 80 bucks, some are worth 150 bucks. And I bought a Beckett's guide, a, a cards guide to say what cards are worth. And I ran home. And to this day, that is still one of the most exciting days in my, my, my life. It was like, I'd won the lottery. Uh, I had a calculator out. I was adding it all up, and I I had almost ten thousand dollars worth of hockey cards. Come on, and, really? Uh, no, seriously. Wow. Now, I'm not old enough. Like, if I'd just been a couple years older, I would have had Wayne Gretzky rookies. But oh. I had lots of I had lots of Gretzky second and third years. I had Mark Messier rookies, uh, and they're all in mint condition because they'd been wrapped up in paper. And um, so. Uh, of course, I just dove right into this this sports card collecting with a passion. And uh, uh, the first thing I did wrong is I never sold anything. I just kept buying more and averaging my cost higher. Um, but it, 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 I think I'm going to write amusing on it one day because um, pretty much any lesson you you need to know in the stock market, you could learn through through that that time of, of sports card collecting. So, you know, today we look at quarterly earnings. Back then. You could have like somebody like an Owen Nolan or someone like at a, looks really promising. His scores are going up and cards are going up in value. But then, you know, a couple of years later, it's not producing and nobody cares about his card anymore. So, that, you know, there's sort of fundamentals to track. And, and uh, there were like Hall of Fame anticipation trades. That's almost like an index inclusion trade today. Um, and, then, and you remember when uh, Jack Morris, uh, and I did baseball cards too, but you remember when Jack Morris moved to the Blue Jays? You know what? I, I'm a real hockey guy. I am not a baseball okay. I remember that. Patrick, there you go. I Patrick's going to have to take over. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I forget where he came from. He came from like Milwaukee or Minnesota or someplace. Uh, but he came to Toronto. Now there's demand for his rookie card. So his rookie card took off and you could you know make money uh, sort of feeding that demand because of things like that. So it, you know, it was a really uh, interesting time. And I mentioned my mom had a variety store. So my dad and I kind of took over a little corner of her store and made it into a little card card shop. And and um, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but in the early 90s, this was a, a genuine bubble. It powered right through the 91, 92 recession. Um, and it, um, um, you know, I, I, sort of the peak when it happened, you may remember there was this, OPC is the Canadian hockey card company. Back in the day, they were it. They were the only company making cards. It was tops in the U.S., and then at the peak, there were probably 10 hockey card uh, companies. But OPC came out with this product called OPC Premier. And it was only like 20 bucks a box. I could buy it through the wholesaler that my mom bought her stuff from. And uh, it went to like $600 a box. And I had oh, bought three or, three or four of these boxes. Um, and another big thing that happened was this Leaf Baseball. And um, we were able to buy a couple boxes, same thing. It went into the five, 600 bucks. And and um, anyway, so, of course, I've, I've had the taste of this now. It's like this stuff only goes up. This never goes down. It's so easy. So I took all the cash I had at the end of the summer from working. Um, I'd saved about 600 bucks, and I put it all into ProSet Platinum. Uh, it was going to be the next OPG premiere. And to make a long story short, here we are 30 years later. I still have the boxes actually in the room next <laughs> to me right now. 
Um, I wouldn't even be able to sell them for half of what I paid for them um, that 30 in years 1990, ago. In $1999. $1999. $1999. Like, uh, maybe yeah. 1992 in that case. But it's just uh, too much of a good thing. Ten, you know, One card company to 10, they printed like crazy and just oversupplied the market. So, um, so I kind of went into when I, you know, got into being in the money management business, I kind of already felt like I'd been through this debilitating crash that really messed up my psyche. <laughs> I, I didn't get that virgin experience that everyone else my age got uh, through the dot com boom. I kind of felt like it was deja vu. Right. You had lost your virginity a lot earlier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Okay. So, um, how, so when did, when do you get bitten by the, the stock trading bug? Uh, well, I, um, I, uh, actually lived with my grandparents for, for a while. And, uh, my grandfather owned two stocks. He owned uh, Royal bank and Denison mines, which was a uranium company. I think it might still be around. It um, is still around. And, yeah. and I read, um, I read these in reports because he had them leaning against his chair that he always sat in. And that led to reading one up on wall street and beating the street by uh, Peter Lynch. And Mm -hmm. that hooked me. I decided after reading those two books that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, And from that point, all the decisions I made in my life was geared towards the goal of becoming a a portfolio manager. And so uh, um, I went to Laurier um, and the reason I went to Laurier well, one, I didn't know I was supposed to go to Western and Queens. Um, I remember my guidance <laughs> counselor asked me if I was, well, you're, you're going to Western. You're going to apply to Western. I was like, no, why would I go there? They don't have a co-op program. I'm going to Laurier. So I went there for the co-op program. Um, one of the first things I did in the first year was I, I joined the student investment club, um, which was awesome because um, I think we had $50,000. And, um, we, you know, we were really, you know, we're making real investments in stocks and it gave students an opportunity to pitch their ideas and, and, and get beat up by your peers, whether it was a good pitch or a bad pitch. And everybody was showing off how much they knew about stocks, especially the older kids. And it was a great learning experience. And I also opened up, um, an investing line account and, um, I, you know, I was getting OSAP loans and, course they pay you up front at the beginning of the semester and it was a um you know so i invested as much of it as i could uh, and hope it turned out okay um and so um so that's that that was uh, i think an important part of 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 you know learning about the market and 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 i think it also led to the luckiest break i ever had uh which is um in back to the co-op program so there were only two jobs really back then in finance at laurier um, it's not like today. There was a Newcrest job uh, and, and Gluskin Chef. And my, my friend Colin Stewart, who uh, actually runs uh, uh, J.C. Clark, a hedge fund in Toronto, uh, he actually got the Newcrest job and I got the Gluskin job. And I think the reason I got that job um, is because uh, being in the investment club, I'd actually been uh, writing research reports on companies. And the company that I own personally, um, it was the first stock I bought. It's called Group Le Pierre and Vareau. It was a Canadian company, GL&V. Um, and it, they made pulp and paper and mining equipment. And it just so happened that their largest factory was in my hometown in Aurelia. And right. uh, my baseball coach actually worked there. So I asked him to hook me up, and I, I got a tour of the plants, and I was able to interview the, the, um, uh, the president of this division. And so when I showed up for my interview... You know, I had this report, I, I owned the stock, I, I interviewed management, and now it's way, way harder today. Um, today, I would expect that if I'm interviewing a student. But back then, that, that was a new thing, and it, I think it really, um, it, I was fortunate that I had done that. And, um, you know, Bill Webb, um, I've, I've thanked you before, but if you're listening now, thank you again for uh, for taking a shot on me, because that, that really did change my life, because everybody needs that you know, that first entry into the industry. And, and, and that was, that was it for me. Right. And so from there, you actually, after you finished university, you went back to Gluskin chef and you got to work with the legendary Ira Gluskin. So what was that like? Oh, well, again, uh, that was, well, the, the co-op student uh, experience was, was amazing. Uh, and um, I, I was fortunate that as a co-op student, I was able to work with Ira um, Ira had his, his corner office, which is kind of a joke. He didn't have an office. He just sat in the corner with 
you know, three foot high pile, three foot high piles of research. And, um, uh, he needed help. Like he was covering a lot of ground and he, he didn't have any direct reports. So the co-op student was his direct report. Uh, and he used to send me to lunches. A lot of them were real estate lunches, um, you know, Rio can and, and, um, uh, Oxford and, and um, uh, you know, uh, Brookfield properties. And um, it was expected that I write a memo uh, on that lunch. And, and one of the things I did that I, I know I were appreciated is I would, I would put down all the important things that came out of the meeting, but I would also give them my opinion of, of whether the story, if I found the story exciting, if I thought management was believable, um, if the crowd was buying into it or, or if they were a skeptical crowd, so I put a lot of color into it, and uh, it was basically, I think, a way for him to be at more meetings than he could possibly go to. And uh, so I hit it off with Ira, uh, and um, I was probably heading towards investment banking. I'd, I'd done the the interviews, um, you know. I remember it's odd. I used to go apply to, to research jobs, and I'd go in for the interview, and it was the investment banker. And I was like, but I applied to the research job. And they say, yeah, yeah well, we get to go through the resumes first. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> um, so you don't want to work in research. But anyways, it, I, I got a job, a, a job offer to go to investment banking. And, and that, I, 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 that kind of forced their hand at Gluskin and, and they hired me. And, and again, I was very lucky for that. And um, uh, Ira, I just spent a few minutes about Ira. Um, he, Ira is a real story guy. Uh, we didn't use the word narrative back then, like it's everywhere today, but Ira, uh, was very good at assessing whether management was trustworthy. And if you ever, um, uh, you know, broke that trust, you were out. That's when he'd sell a stock. He wouldn't sell a stock for valuation. He was betting on the jockey and he could really, he really had a good sense for, is this a good story? Is it for real? And if this story gets told to a bunch of other investors, are they going to get excited and, and want to invest in it as well? Um, and, you know, I sat in, I don't know how many management interviews with him. And it evolved, of course, to me being the bad cop and he was the good cop. Uh, but that was my education was just hundreds and hundreds of meetings with management with Ira. And, um, you know, I just I tried to be a sponge and, and learn as much as I could from him. And uh, yeah, the other thing I'd say real quick is, you know, he grew up on the South side. He'd been a research analyst. He'd been on investment. He'd been the president of a brokerage. And even to this day, everybody loves Ira. He's a classy guy. And um, he generally appreciates all the work that, that investment bankers do, research guys. Um, um, and he would show that appreciation. And, and he's just got a you know great reputation for being a good guy. Yeah, for those uh, Americans that aren't listening, uh, I mean that are listening, <laughs> that aren't listening, that are listening, <laughs> that um, Ira, Ira Gluskin is is a legend in Canada and is generally, as um, Brad says, generally considered one of the great guys. But not only that, you're uh, the opportunity to sit beside him and to be, uh, you know, his second, in, you know, in command there as you're going through all those sorts of meetings is just it was a truly wonderful experience that I'm sure lots of people are jealous of. So as you're sitting there, Brad, and you're going through this, um, there was some kind of changes in terms of opportunities that you saw as the markets were going along. And one of them that you mentioned to me was the income trusts. And you said that this was the greatest alpha opportunity that you have ever seen and might ever see in your career. Why don't you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, start back. Uh, you know, I started in uh, 97 was co-op, 98 was full-time. I actually started uh, doing real estate, and then I shifted pretty quickly into technology because that, you know, 98, 99, 00. Um, and um, I got lucky again because back then, and it's kind of like the circle of life, right? Um, now I'm the old guy that's been through too many booms and busts. I need a young guy that is fearless to do this tech investing. Uh, back then, I was the 23, 24, 25-year-old kid that knew about technology and, and was explaining it to the old guys. And of course, um, you know, I uh, I made a few pitches and the stocks went up and it all ended very badly. But I was just an analyst then, two, two three years out of school. So I didn't have to wear any of that responsibility, um, not, you know, not being a portfolio manager. Um, so I, I very quickly moved on to back to value and real estate and income trusts. And so in Canada, just for our, your American listeners, it's kind of like your MS, 
or your MLP market in the U.S. These are trusts uh, that don't have to pay tax as long as they paid all the income out. Uh, and so they would come public with 8 9 10% yields, um, and uh, retail investors loved it. And so it developed into quite a big uh, uh, boom. I think at one point, it was about 15% of the total um, stock market capitalization in Canada. And um, it was very concentrated as well. There were kind of seven or eight uh, firms. Um, you know, I think of Oscar Belash at Dynamic, uh, Sandy McIntyre, you know, myself and Ira. Um, there were seven or eight people institutionally that managed all the, all the money. And um, on the sales desk, there were you know, uh, independent teams that focus just on income trusts. And my partner that uh, co-founded uh, Warsaw with me, Blair Levinsky, he was the number one sell side guy in that space. So um, that's a little bit on, on the background to the space. But so 01, 02, 03, it was just a, you know, a glorious straight up booming market. And then um, in 2004, um, I went to my partners with the idea of starting a hedge fund. Um, and the reason I did that was there was so much crap, for lack of a better term, coming public. Um, it was too irresistible not to short this stuff. And I just give you a quick example. I remember there was one company, I think it was, I think it was called Builders Energy Services Trust. So for your younger listeners, if you think of how hated energy service companies are today, imagine a world where you could IPO a $70 million company where you basically have an investment banker fly out to Calgary and Edmonton and uh, find five people who don't know each other and design a new logo and say, okay, we're going to take this thing public and put a 10% yield on it. Uh, and it would be the hottest thing, you know, since sliced bread, people, you know, dying to get into it. That was the kind of market it was. Um, and it actually fit well for us at the time because we, we were a long only firm. And a lot of our clients had been in, invested in our long only income trust fund for a, quite a few years. And they were worried back then about interest rates going up, which is hilarious because I think yields were like 6% or something back then. And they were afraid of yields going up. I was afraid of them going up too. The other big fear was that the government would pull the plug on income trust one day. And of course they did. And so our clients actually loved the idea of a long short income trust fund because it allowed me as the manager to mitigate those two big risks that everybody was afraid of. And um, uh, the, yeah, just the reason there was so much alpha is it was a yield market. Everything came public at a eight or 9% yield and growth was free for a while. And then you had to pay a little bit for it, but it was still, you know, it was still very inexpensive and businesses that had no chance of being able to sustain their dividend over a cycle uh, were, were, overvalued. And the best thing about it is uh, for a long time, I was the only uh, person shorting income trusts in the country because everybody was afraid of the 9% carry. And I always rationalized it. And I said, well, the one I'm going long got almost a 9% yield too. So I don't really care that I'm, I'm paying the carry. And um, so it, it was, you know, we, I think, I think we did uh, over a five and a half year period for that fund. I think we did a 20% net return uh, and that's after a, a two and twenty uh, fee structure. Um, it, it was just, you know, it was just a great time. That that right. that is a terrific story. Like that, I I had no idea that you were kind of at the forefront of that. I do remember that period, and I do remember people being so scared of it because the yield just ended up, you know, worrying them. They were like, "How can you be short that? You're going to have to pay it." You know, and as we, as we talk about short selling. What was that experience like? Because up until that point, you, as you mentioned, you were a, a long only. You know what were is what was kind of the uh, the things that you learned and the 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 and how investing changed on the short side for you. Right. So yeah. So I've I've now experienced both ends of the spectrum. I've experienced having a market to yourself that was very inefficient with almost no competition on the short side to a market like today where um, shorting is just very difficult because everybody in this industry is smart. Um, everybody can sort of see the same things. And it's often the case that the businesses that um, have the most things wrong with them are the ones that the shorts are attracted to. And so, you know, you get short squeezes. Like the last two months have been a dramatic 
you know, anything with a bad balance sheet, even companies that have very obvious secular decline issues, uh, they've been the actually the best performing stock. So, so I've experienced uh, uh, both things. They're both ends of the spectrum, um, and I'd say that um, um, I'm more attracted these days to, to the less obvious shorts. Um, and um, you know, one way to think about it is to be, think of a long that everybody loves that's gone against you, and you, and you analyze well where did I go wrong? Like it, you know, blew up on you. Um, uh, but everybody loved it. That's sort of the, the more attractive short to look for today versus trying to short something that is, is you know, everybody and their, their uncle is short. Um, but yeah, I, di- I did learn a lot and it was trial by um, fire. And, um, you know, uh, you've probably heard a lot about factor investing. Uh, and it's a big word today. Everybody knows about it where, you know, it's stocks aren't just stocks. They might be tagged with uh, high momentum, uh, high short interest, um, you know, they're, they're factors as well. And I kind of learned that running a hedge fund um, back then because, you know, I remember when I uh, was using ETFs as my hedge and I was long, small and mid caps. And I, I learned that doesn't doesn't work out so well in a correction. Uh, and uh, I, I've been through some short squeezes where, um, so I just kept basically building a, uh, a collection or a, a, a repertoire of, of lessons and so, uh, in a way, I've, I've been doing factor investing since I started, um, and, um, and 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 you know, figuring out how to do it on my own because I, I am self-taught with with shorting. Um, Ira, I think to this day hasn't shorted the stock. Um, um, I kind of had to teach teach that to myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I, but I'll, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead, Brad. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, I was just going to say um, a little bit more on shorting. I'd say that there's, there's a couple different types of shorts. So there's personal shorts where you really don't like the company and it could be something that, you know, is, is not, uh, you know, kosher, um, playing some accounting games, what have you. Um, those ones are very intensive, very time intensive. They have the most psychic value when, when you get them right, they're very satisfying. Um, uh, but the truth is a lot of the shorting that I do, um, is, either uh, for risk mitigation. So it's a factor head. It's, you know, I don't have anything personal against it. It's just not as good as the name that I'm long, where I think I'm going to get the alpha from. And then the other type of shorting that I do is, is um, uh, I think the stock's going to go up. I just don't think it's going to go up as much as my long. So it's like a, it's a cheap funding source. Uh, if you think of your long short book as a, as a bank, almost, you've got your liabilities and your assets and you want your assets to have a higher return than your liabilities. Um, and so the way I look at that is I, I think of five year races, you know, I'll put, I'll put a couple of stocks up against a couple of stocks short and I, I have high confidence that over five years, my total return on the long side is going to uh, clobber the short side. Um, but I, I do want to go back to that, that personal short thing. I, I was going to tell you a story. Um, and I'll say that, you know, less than 1% of the shorting that I've done in my career is, is like this story. But again, it was the most uh, rewarding psychologically, and um, and it was fun. Uh, and I probably have five or six stories like this, but the the one I like to tell is about a company called Birch Mountain. Uh, do you remember that name at all? Oh yeah, for sure. It was uh, gravel or something, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah. So remember the China boom, oil sands boom. So it's two thousand four, two thousand five. Uh, oil sands are going like crazy. Um, can you think of a better name than Birch Mountain? They're go- they were going to go build the uh, you know the biggest gravel pit in the country, smack dab in the middle of the oil sands, uh, and then it had an environmental angle because they decided well we're also going to put in some autoclaves and we're going to we're going to make some quick lime and it's going to go into the smokestacks to make the environment cleaner. Um, and like any good promote, it has to keep getting bigger and bigger. That's that's how you grow the market cap. So it started as the gravel pit, went to the quick lime. Then they added a, a cement angle. They're going to build a cement plant. And I remember I had the, the CEO in my office, and I just, you know, put it out there for him. I said, "Well, what? Why not? Uh, why not buy a, a truck fleet and start selling ready mix as well?" He's like, "Great idea. I was going to look into that when we get back." Um, anyway, so it was the perfect story for the time, and Kramer was pumping it uh, on TV. Um, but I went back and looked at the history, and the, and I think the. the with these short stories like this that you can always see in the history um, that, you know, management doesn't change their colors. So if you went back to the nineties, 
in the mid nineties, Birch Mountain, same management team, it was actually um they were looking for gold in Indonesia. So Briax had gone big and they were a you know a proximity play to Briax and they were trying to ride that boom. Fast forward to the dot com boom. Nobody cares about Indonesian gold and the dot com boom. Now Birch Mountain had become a technology company. Same management team. They bought this deposit in Alberta and they claimed to have uh, this technology where they could get nanoparticles of gold out of the deposit. Um, and um, it turned out it didn't work. The, uh, I, I, and again, I'm going by memory here, but there was actually a cease trading order on it on the venture exchange. And um, the regulators hired an independent consultant to write a report. And he concluded that they have just as much gold in their deposit as you and I do in our backyards. They had the, glo- they had the global sedimentary average for gold. And that there was no indication that they had any new technology to get this gold out. So, but you know, that's what promoters do, right? You find the, the, the booming market and then you craft the story to go with it. So here we are, fast forward, dot com, the, the dot com boom busts. Now it's all about China and oil and commodities. Voila, same management team. Now they just happen to be building the biggest gravel pit in the country uh, to service this industry. Uh, and um, so we went out there, uh, Reno and I, uh, my colleague at the time, Reno Giancola, he works over at uh, Fairfax now. Um, and um, we, um, we went out and visited the operation, uh, but we hung around for a couple of days. And we went to um, uh, visit their, their uh, customers, so ready mix operators that buy aggregate. Uh, we went and visited the, the the guy that ran the local municipal quarry, the one that they said was running out of reserve life. Um, and we actually we bought gift certificates from Earl's because uh, it's kind of like that. You know, you ever see that Bob and Doug McKenzie movie uh, when they go in with the jelly donuts? Yeah. Um, so so we just you know look we we know you're busy. We appreciate your time. We'd like to learn about the industry. And you know, here's a small thank you. We've got a gift certificate. And and everybody would talk to us. And uh, and well, we'd be very coming. um so and you know we learned two things uh from that trip um and the first was that they weren't talking to any of their customers um and there was one guy said well yeah i saw them about a year and a half ago but i haven't heard heard from them since and they were getting close to production so it seemed odd that their customers were saying they weren't talking to them um and the other thing we learned is that at least the belief of the people we talked to, there was no shortage. There was no imminent shortage of aggregate in the area. The municipal pit uh, had uh, many years left. And uh, one guy said that he actually has a hobby. He went prospecting all the time. And he, he says the stuff was everywhere. So, so that sort of had us feeling like we might be on to something. And then they came out with a feasibility study. Uh, and it had like a billion dollar net present value in it. It had the cement plant. The bottom line of this feasibility and I'd never gone through a feasibility study like I went through that one. Uh, but the bottom line was they actually had really good limestone aggregate, but it was really, really deep. Um, there was a big layer of um, overburden, but it, it wasn't called overburden. They called it Class B road aggregate, and they assumed that they could sell it for a, a lower discounted price. Uh, uh-huh. Now, if that if that were the case you're looking at a real mine with a good product. If the class B road aggregate actually was, was not really saleable, then there's no way this thing would have been built because the strip ratio just did not make any sense. And so we went out there again and um, if there's any management teams listening, you know, here's a tip for you. If you've got short sellers visiting you, don't send them around the property with a lower level management guy. Uh, make sure you go with them. Uh, <laughs> So I remember we were driving around, um, and we'd already had discussions with the management team about Class B and the pricing and all that. So we're going with you know a, a, a management a guy from out in the in the in the pit, and driving around, and and we asked him about the Class B road aggregate. And he looked, he said, "What? That's the garbage pile." And so, so we had one guy telling us it was the garbage pile, and the management team telling us it was the Class B road aggregate. So from that point, we knew we just had to watch that pile and see if it got bigger or smaller. And we actually, um, when we got back to the office, we actually hired a, um, an, uh, an air, uh, a guy with an airplane to go up and take pictures for us once a month so we could try to estimate um, if this pile was getting bigger or not. So, um, so that was a, you know, a, a really a fun one. It worked out well for us. 
we uh, we made good money shorting it. We had to go through Max Payne though. Like that's a real thing. It's it's is is you you have to go through Max Payne before these things work out. So it did go higher than where we shorted it. Um, and I think uh, you know the way it worked out, it ended up going bankrupt. Uh, they had borrowed some money from Brookfield, and Brookfield ended up getting control of the asset. And I think uh, I think there was a lawsuit. Lane and McDonald taking it back to hockey, a you know, great hockey player. I think he actually might have been a director, and he was involved in, in suing them. But um, uh, it went bankrupt. But it is it is an operation today. Um, they um, it's a gravel pit, but that's all it is. There's no there's no quick lime. There's no cement. There's no ready mix. Um, and it's you know it's a pretty small gravel pit at that. So. Um, Anyways, they don't always work out like that, but you know, it was it was it was a fun a fun one to do at the time. That's a great the, the, story. Yeah, that is a terrific story. The idea that you hired a plane to fly by once a month is awesome. You you know, yeah. hedge funds nowadays use uh, satellite TV or, or satellite images. You're you were the kind of the forefront of that. You were doing it old school. Yeah. Yeah. Back <laughs> when you could do it without a budget, you do it nowadays. You need a big budget to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And there's That's so many awesome. people doing it. So why don't we talk a little bit about your move from Ira Gluskin shop to your own shop? What um, what were the reasons you did it, and uh, what's that experience been like? Uh, well, it's actually it's been an amazing experience. Uh, it's 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 fun and challenging to create something and to create something with others. Um, we've got a amazing investment team, and uh, uh, so. Yeah, but just to back up, uh, so I was at Gluskin Chef, and uh, uh, I mentioned Blair Levinsky. He was the number one income trust uh, guy on the sell side, and we'd become friends. And occasionally, he'd he'd, he'd bring it up. Uh, he'd say, uh, um, you know, maybe one day we'll start our own place. And and you know, I I was like, yeah, one day things are pretty good. And you know, I was starting a family, and and um, uh, but you know, we we went public. Gluskin Chef was a public company. It recently got taken out. Um, and, um, it just, things changed being a public company and went from, you know, being seven or eight people owning the firm, deciding on everything together, you know, was sort of filling that entrepreneurial need that, that I'd always, uh, sought. Um, and then after we were public, uh, you know, there's a board of directors, there's, there's layers of different titles and, and it just, be, it started to feel a, a little less entrepreneurial and a more, bu- more bureaucratic, and uh, I had always been very tight with with Ira, uh, and Ira and Jerry were kind of, you know, it was, the firm was transitioning, and and so it just seemed like the right time, and Blair was ready to go, and so uh, in January 2010, uh, we left to start Waratah, uh, and Waratah, by the way, is, um, it's a flower that grows in Australia, and we've never been to Australia. I've been to New Zealand, but um, it's it's the state flower of New South Wales. Uh, and it's it's a symbol of resilience. It has deep roots, and after fires go through, um, it thrives uh, in that environment. And you know, we started it pretty close to 2008, 2009, and and we like the symbol symbolism of of that name. And um, we started at first with our own money, and um, and today we we manage 1.7 billion, and we have over 40 employees. Wow, that's unbelievable! It's it's uh, it's a great yeah. Canadian success story. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun, and um, like I said, we've we've got a great team, um, operations people are great, and uh, marketing, client service, and our investment team. I, you know, I worked with Janine Lee Chong um, at at Gluskin Chef. Uh, she was there even longer than I was, and and she and Adrian Wong are, are with us. And so we've, I, I'm I'm pleased because you know when you start the firm on your own, especially in the first three four years, a lot of the weights on your own on your shoulder. And it's like, how do I, how do I scale? How do I scale myself? How do I, um, and you know, and I'd say in the last three or four years, um, I just feel great about the, the, the quality and depth of the investment team that we've been able to put together. Well, that's terrific. So now let's move on to the markets and what you think about them today. Yeah. Obviously, uh, with the coronavirus, it's, uh, unprecedented times. What is your general feeling about whether this rise can continue and, how are you positioning yourself? I'd say that I, I think it's I think it's going to continue. I think we're in a bit of a um, and, and I've read some of your stuff, Kevin, and, and heard some of your podcasts. I, I think we're probably we share a lot of the same views. 
I think we're in a transition period, but I do think we're going to have a, a Goldilocks or a honeymoon type period here uh, because, um, you know, the government's thrown so much at this. Uh, uh, fiscal and monetary, you know, uh, money supply is up. Uh, everyone's got cash. They're paying down their credit cards. I think when the economy opens back up, that money's going to get spent again. And so we're going to get the benefits of, of, of money printing. And, and this time the money printing is going into the economy. It's not like with QE where it's just driving asset prices up. I think we're going to get this flow into the economy and we're going to get all the good from it. And the bad that comes from it, it's going to take a while. So in that environment, I think we can keep seeing multiple expansion. And I think, you know, I think what are the risks? One of the risks is to the upside, because um, if you look at where bonds are trading, government say 10-year bonds, after you tax affect them, because you got to pay tax on interest income, bonds are trading at like 300 PE. And in that world, why can't Microsoft go to 100 PE? Right, your Microsoft, you're getting currently it's about a two and a half percent free cash flow yield. You're getting a, a, a good dividend. It's great, great balance sheet. Things probably going to be able to grow at 12 to 15 percent per year. Um, inflation's real. Uh, I, I I still think we're looking at at uh, inflation of probably two percent, and it's probably going to go higher. Um, so why would you ever buy a bond over Microsoft? So I think for very high quality names. Uh, Microsoft, Costco, um, Adobe, Roper, I own all those names. I think there's a lot of room for multiple expansion there. Uh, but I do think that we're in a transition period. And I, I think, you ever see that movie Clash of the Titans? They, oh, yeah. they have the, the, cra- the Kraken. So they've released the Kraken, right? We've been <laughs> afraid of deflation for 20 years. And this, COVID crisis gave them the political cover uh, to just unleash it. And it's here and that money's going to be in the economy. And they basically, they have no choice. You know, I don't know where the U S debt is going to be $3 trillion. I, I don't know, but there's so much debt in the system. Um, by some measures, it's, it's, it's higher than it was at the end of world war II. And um, there's a guy that I subscribe to um, named Russell Napier. Um, he's an economist out of Scotland, um, and I think he's he's bang on with this. You know, he refers to it as financial repression. The only way out of this is to um, keep interest rates low and get nominal GDP growing, so i.e. create inflation. I don't think there's going to be hyperinflation, but there's no reason we can't have 4 or 5% inflation because that's exactly what the doctor ordered. They need the nominal economy to grow to pay down this debt. Uh, and so I think there will be a regime change, and I think um, I think it's the time. You know, you look on Twitter. You know, they call themselves compounder bros or whatever. But like, you can't just have an entire portfolio of Microsoft and Adobe. I think the time has come to start to look for some of these names that are going to benefit from higher inflation businesses that have um, you know a high fixed asset base that don't require a lot of of reinvestment that will certainly can't be in secular decline. You want to stay away from that stuff. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think you need to start building that into your portfolio, at least get your, your feet wet so that you can make that transition when and if it comes. So is that a return to value then? Is it because a lot of those names would, would they not kind of, kind of fit into that kind of value bucket? Well, it would be, but I'd say like, Again, there's a million definitions of what the value, what that means. But I would say that, yes, these stocks are cheaper because they're not capital light businesses for the most part. Um, right. and, I'll, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a second. But but I still think you want to stay away from things that are in outright secular decline. Like I wouldn't be buying movie theaters right now or anything like that. Um, you know, a good example would be something like, um, um, well, theme parks. Theme parks actually did exceptionally well uh, in past inflationary periods. You, um, Kevin, you're, you're, you live in Toronto. You're, you know Canada's Wonderland, right? Right. Um, Canada's Wonderland, the, it's the highest attendance theme park in uh, North America that's only open for the summer. Like there's bigger parks that are open year-round, but for the summer only, it's got the highest attendance. Toronto is a bustling city with incredibly high real estate values. Um, there's probably 6 million people within a one hour drive of this park. 
it's a monopoly. Um, it has tremendous pricing power. Um, you, uh, um, uh, they actually own 295 acres, uh, which we've done some work on this and valued all the land that, that the company that the company that owns Canada's Wonderland is called Cedar Fair. Um, but Canada's Wonderland, just the land is worth almost a billion dollars. Um, wow. And um, and if you look at it, so consumers are the ones getting money. They're going to spend it. They have a high propensity to spend. And I think on the other side of this COVID, you get through all these fears about reopening and are people afraid to go out? You look out a year or two, I think those are great examples of businesses. They're basically land banking businesses. Um, Cedar Fair that owns Canada's Wonderland, they also own a park in Santa Clara, California. Um, that's it's right beside Google's head office. It's a few miles from Apple's head office. It's basically Silicon Valley real estate with a theme park on top. Um, they own a third one, Knott's Berry Farms, um, which is a few miles away from uh, Disneyland in California. Um, uh, four of their parks make up about 85% of their EBITDA. So, so that's the type of business that I think on the other side, um, people will start to appreciate. So if you think that inflation is coming back, the 4 or 5%, are you also kind of warm to the precious uh, yellow fellow, the gold? Uh, yes. Uh, I am. And, you know, everybody knows this, but traditionally gold uh, does well when you have negative real returns. And I have high confidence that the only way the system's going to get through this is by maintaining negative real returns. And so that makes me bullish on gold. Um, I also, you know, a quick story on this. I had actually posted this on Twitter because I was blown away. So this is back on April 1st. So the market was, was a little bit up from the lows, but but it was still pretty close to the lows. And a guy I deal with, Carter Worth, sent me a chart. And it was, it was gold, just the metal, uh, since May 1997 to April 1st of this year. It was an even race. And, and it blew my mind because I, that's basically my entire career. And I was like, yeah, I know we just had this quick correction and all, but it's been a pretty good 11-year bull market and, you know, up to 08 was good and the dot com was good. It blew my mind that over a 23 year period, uh, and this is including dividends reinvested, how can this lump of metal that does nothing have matched interest rates going to zero, tax rates getting cut to the lowest they've ever been, 60 year low in unemployment, 11 years of stock market going straight up, other than you know the dip in March, and here it, it was an even race. And if you think about it, um, it's sort of, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And the, the, the sad truth is a huge percentage of what everyone thinks is equity return is really just inflation. If you use gold to measure what inflation is, if you, if you look at, you know, um, how many hours of work it takes to buy an ounce of gold or, or that sort of thing. And, and so if you take something like, um, uh, Disney uh, World in California. It opened, I think it opened in 72. It was $3.50 uh, when it opened in 72. And it's 140 bucks on average to get in now. Uh, so if you'd owned a stock that tracked just that one theme park, um, you know, you'd be really happy with the results. But a big percentage of it was just the pricing power over time. Right. And so, so I, do like gold, I do like gold. And I like the gold stocks because for most of my career, gold stocks were very expensive. They had these, you know, really low free cash flow yields and, and big multiples. But I think most of them are kind of seven, eight times EBITDA right now. Um, Kirkland Lake Gold is one that um, that we own that I like. Um, they have no net debt. They've got five hundred million dollars of, of cash. Their margins are in the sixties. It looks like a, a cloud so- Well, not cloud. It looks like a software company. Um, and, uh, CapEx is pretty low. Um, they, um, and it's, it's free cash flow yields. You know, I think it's close to a 10% free cash flow yield. So, you know, what's not to like with valuations like that. And especially when you think of the macro picture, um, that we're facing. So if right. we do get this shift in the narrative, like if we've kind of hit the point where we're going to have inflation, what do you think that most people are going to be, wrongly positioned in like where are the mistakes that people are going to make in the over the coming years as this uh, environment switches 
Well, again, nobody knows. I don't know. But even despite that, it's my job to try to make guesses at that. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of animal spirits out there. Um, and it's, it's very, I think it's, it's, it's actually, it's rivaling what happened in, in the, the dot-com days. Um, sometimes people will point to the nifty 50 or valuations from, from the dot com days. And, um, one thing you can do, and I, I urge your listeners to do this. I've, I've done this, go back and get annual reports from the peak year from 72 and get them from 1999, 2000 and, um, look at them as if you're looking at them today and say, well, what would I pay for them today? And in a lot of cases, valuations. Uh, are well, I think they're well through the Nifty 50 valuation. If you look at uh, EV to EBITDA and uh, price to free cash flow valuations, um, and but of course the difference is interest rates are low, so you can always justify everything we see today with with the interest rate argument. Uh, but I think that the risks are in some of these things, like you know some of these software stocks that are trading at some as high as 50 times revenue, even though they don't have any EBITDA or or free cash flow, um, and you know I believe in multiple expansion from here, but I think it's it's going to be in the names where people can say, well, if a bond is that, this thing looks pretty good compared to a bond. So it's got to have quality, staying power, margins. That's why I mentioned Costco, Microsoft, Adobe. Uh, I wouldn't be hanging around in in the stuff that's gone crazy that that the Robinhood guys are are trading in right now, uh, and then I think. I think that um, eventually when we do get inflation, I think you're going to, to see some multiple compression after we, you know, at some point down the road. But I think we've got another leg up before we get the compression. So what, what will be the, tr- the triggering factor of that compression? Will that be when interest rates finally start spiking? Well, that's really interesting because I think the conventional view and it's my view, I share it, is that rates can't spike. They won't be allowed to spike. The, the Fed will just you know, create money and stand there on the bid and, and buy everything they need to to make sure that, that rates don't go up. And, but I think it's universal that everybody believes that, and which makes me a little bit worried because the worst thing that could happen would be, can you imagine if the bond market actually ran away from the central banks? And even though they did everything they could, they couldn't stop it. Like that's, that's scary to even think about that. Um, I don't think that's going to happen, but I just find it interesting that nobody thinks that could is even a possibility. Um, well, but my work, I'm pretty, uh, oh, sorry. Is, yeah. I'm pretty, Go ahead, sorry. On the, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just laughing because I was saying nobody is, uh, I'm actually pretty bearish on the bond market. So I actually think it's a better chance than people think. And one of the things that I believe is that they'll, that they'll peg the front end of the curve and they'll let the long end trade. So what I was going to ask you is if we got a situation where the, the, the front end was left low, let's just say it's left at 1%, but meanwhile, the long end trades at like, I don't know, eight, what do you think would happen to stock markets in those, in those kind of multiples in that environment? Well, if the economy was still doing well while that was happening and we had good nominal growth, uh, dare I say it, it's been said many times before and it never came to pass but uh, the great rotation i I think stock markets probably uh, get hurt because of the weighting of high multiple growth stocks but i think you'd finally see that shift back into stocks that are asset heavy that um, would benefit Uh, banks obviously would do well in that environment with the steepening Um, and um, so i I think that's what would happen like i wouldn't want to i wouldn't be hanging around in in you know, stocks trading at 30, 40, 50 times earnings when that happens. Right. And so now the real question would be as the indexes as a whole, would they go down or up? And that's difficult to say, depending on how kind of concentrated and heavy those top names are. Exactly. Um, So if we get this blow off top first, and the you know the the top five stocks what are they now twenty five percent or some twenty two twenty five percent you know if they're at fifty percent when that rotation finally comes I think we get a down market. So you sat through the dot com bubble and you saw the craziness in terms of the uh, 
the valuations and the people trading. And you, you already mentioned and alluded to the fact that this is beginning to resemble that. I don't know if you've been watching this Dave Portnoy guy, the, the, the new, the, the new kind of millennial darling, this guy that uh, has gotten the, uh, captured the imagination of the Robin Hood crowd. What do you think of him? I think he's very entertaining. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I think I made a comment the other day. I, I pray he discovers junior golds. That would be great. <laughs> you can put, put, put them onto a few stock charts there. Um, but look, it's, if you develop a feeling for this, right. It, and it is a feeling you feel max pain and max pleasure. And, you know, when, when Warren Buffett's getting dissed like that, like it's, it, it's, everything's a cycle, right? It, it, everything just cycles. Lessons need to be relearned. And, and, um, it's, it's never, is no different. Remember 3d printing stocks got crazy like this and they flamed out marijuana stocks. This stuff's going to flame out too. Okay. So yeah. Brad, let's, let's kind of bring it back and uh, kind of wrap this up. But before we do, let's talk about, you know, what you've learned throughout the years. And if you were to go and meet the Brad of, uh, Let's just say the the fellow that was about to speculate and never sell a hockey card. What would you tell a young person uh, like that? What advice would you give to yourself back, you know, that you know now that you didn't know then? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I'm pretty happy with, with how things have, have turned out uh, for me. And I also wouldn't want to deny the younger me the opportunity of making mistakes and learning because that's how you learn these things. Um, and so, um, you know, making mistakes and going through booms and busts, that's, that's, I think what, what builds your skill set. Um, but I'd say I'd probably, I'd go back and I'd say, you know what, just, just buy Microsoft and <laughs> go to the beach for the next, just take it easy. <laughs> Because it doesn't have to. Hey, Dunkley, it doesn't have to be this hard. You're making it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this? You you mentioned that you said that when uh, kind of younger people come looking for a job now, you would expect them to have uh, a research report. That would be kind of the minimum. What advice do you give, uh, kind of, if you were to go and and talk to a room full of, uh, let's just say, Laurier uh, kind of finance majors? What would you give them as the important things to work on? to differentiate themselves and to get a job in the investment industry? Uh, I've been asked that before, and I'll give you the answer that I've given in the past, but I'll, I'll give it with a new twist. So what I've said in the past is I tell my story about my research report, but I say, you know, that that's nothing. Um, I, I once met a portfolio manager uh, who uh, he had been on the sell side, disappeared for a year to a year and a half and I met him again as he's a portfolio manager. He's working for a very well-known U S hedge fund. And we were talking stocks and I asked him, so by the way, like how did you get your job? Cause I remember you were at this shop on the sell side. He said, Oh, like, well, I didn't want to be on the sell side. I made a list of 10 people that I wanted to work for. And he told me who they were. One of them was Warren Buffett. He's like, and I spent a year researching the best idea, stock idea I could find. And I spent an entire year on it and became an expert on that stock. And I, I I sent the report in a letter to the 10 people that, and only those 10 people that I wanted to work for. And I think he said he got like three interviews and he ended up getting a job, like a dream job with one of the managers. And I tell that story to people because the it's, it is very, very competitive. But I also say, if you've got the basic intelligence and the passion and the drive, that's the order qualifier. But if you have that, if you go above and beyond and put the effort in, even though there's no guarantee you ever get a reward for it, that's what people that do hiring appreciate. And the little, you know, and I said to them, I finished, I said, look, you guys are what? How many hours? You got 18 hours of class per week? Well, when you go into first year investment banking, now maybe it's different nowadays, but you can probably be working 80, 90 hours a week. You guys, it's like you're on vacation. You got 18 hours of class. Imagine if for the last two years, you'd said, I'm going to spend five hours a day becoming an expert on pick your hedge fund manager's single biggest position so that I can go prove to him that I know that company better than he does. And nobody does it. 
and that's why it works when you do do it. And so that's the advice I give. And the one wrinkle I'd give, uh, the change I do is I just discovered Twitter like a year ago. And I'm so glad I did. I, it's, it's brought more joy to my job. I get ideas from it. It helps me gauge sentiment. But most of all, I've been impressed with how smart people are. Half the people, they got some funny picture. I mean, it's some funny name. I don't even know who they are. They could be a dentist for all I know. But it doesn't matter. It's like total meritocracy. And we're, like I said, we have a great investment team. I'm not looking to hire anybody right now. But I've already decided the next time I'm going to hire somebody, I'm going to go looking on Twitter. And I, I've already got a few people in mind. Like I've been super impressed with the quality on Twitter. And so I would say do what I said before, but direct it into your, your Twitter and, and prove to the world that you're, you're as good as you think you are. That's awesome. Nice. So now listen, Brad, I actually forgot to ask you, like a true Canadian, you, you went and look, look, kind of found out about the huddle and you decided you were going to drink beer with us. So I really appreciate that. And then we didn't even ask you about it. So what are you drinking? I'm drinking a Coors Banquet. And okay. uh, most I, yeah, I was going to say, I, I give you all this uh, <laughs> kind of uh, promote you as a Canadian and then you're drinking Coors Banquet. What is that? I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Well, it's, it's very smooth and creamy. Uh, my go-to beer is Coors Light, but I was at a wedding last year, and they had Coors Banquet in these little stubbies. Oh, and, like the um, old school, the stubbies. Uh, yeah, and I, I just went wild for it. And it's like I said, this is my new beer. Nice. There, you, there you go. Well, listen, Brad, where can people, you mentioned Twitter, where can people find you on Twitter, and where, if they wanted to learn more about your shop, where would they go for that? Uh, yeah. So Twitter, I, I think it's at Brad Dunkley. I, um, I think that's my handle. It is for uh, sure. And, I, I just checked. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our website is waratahadvisors.com. Terrific. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and speaking with us today. No, oh, I had a lot of fun and, and thank you. Lena, hop on. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Lena, what beer are we drinking? We are drinking another Junction Craft Brewery's beer, Junction Hazy IPA. Nice. Nice. It is super hazy, deep gold, bright stone fruit aromas, full-bodied, creamy mouthfeel with low bitterness. I, I don't know about that description. There's part of that that just leaves me uneasy. I don't know <laughs> Which why. part? Creamy mouthfeel? I, I didn't say <laughs> it. I didn't about? say it. You said it. <laughs> I wonder why I like it. No, it's... <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay, I'm going right. to do... Uh, yeah, let's Kev, just keep do, going here. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah get Kev, on to do, the, do the legal disclaimer stuff. here. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include triple witching twitches, Main Street mumps, and Hertz dirt balls. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I actually have some Hertz dirt balls. I have a position in that. <laughs> There you go. Nathan Tankus is the research director of the Modern Money Network. He has written for the Financial Times, Business Insider, Naked Capitalism, The Appeal, and JSTOR Daily. Welcome to the show, Nathan. It's great to have you here. Great to be here. Well, I'm excited about this because last week when the article from Atlantic, um, it was actually a story by Frank Partnoy, and he called it the looming bank collapse, kind of hit the wires. Traders were passing this around. And uh, it's very quickly, the market sold off and everyone got excited about it. And uh, it seemed to be something that was kind of reminiscent of the 2008 great financial crisis. And uh, it got people a little nervous. And I'll just read the first paragraph here. And uh, then you and I are going to jump into why you don't think it's like the 2008 and that this is actually much different. So this is what Frank wrote. He's wrote, after months of living with the coronavirus pandemic, American citizens are well aware of the toll it has taken on the economy. Broken supply chains, record unemployment, failing businesses. All of these factors are serious and could mire the United States in a deep, prolonged recession. But there's another threat to the economy, too. It lurks on the balance sheets of the big banks, and it could be cataclysmic. Imagine if, in addition to all the uncertainty surrounding the pandemic, you woke up one morning to find that the financial system had collapsed. You may think that such a crisis is unlikely. 
with the memories of the 2008 crash still so fresh. But banks learned few lessons from that calamity, and new laws intended to keep them from taking on too much risk have failed to do so. As a result, we could be on the precipice of another crash, one different from 2008, less in kind than in degree. This one could be worse. So what do you think about that, Nathan? Um, well, um, I think, you know, it starts, it's scary. I think it starts with this layer of plausibility. But when you get into the details of his case, I just, I think his details of his case really fall apart. Um, and, and not so much because there isn't potential stresses in the banking system. As I discussed in the, in the piece and in the follow-up piece, you know, when you have businesses and households that are, are – uh, on mass uh, in financial distress, it's you know things can happen. You know we, we're probably going to need a lot of loans restructuring or you know lenders quote unquote working with borrowers. You know it's possible that these balance sheets could be under stress. But his case isn't this sort of general. There's you know general macroeconomic issues from the shutdown of the economy. His case is focusing on um, specific uh, structured financial instruments. And making the case that these instruments are are going to blow up the economy the way they did in 2008, and making the case that this is really, you know, that those the problems with these things are the problems from 2008, and it's you know the the shutdown is more just like an inciting incident to the underlying problem rather than our entire macroeconomic problem. Right. So Frank, uh, during his in his piece, he kind of focuses on these CLOs. Why don't you explain to kind of our listeners what a CLO is? Sure. So a collateralized loan obligation is, in essence, it's it's a security, and it's a security that's like a mortgage-backed security, which will you know get back to that very important point later. Um, that takes these underlying loans, these what are called leveraged loans, um, which are loans to non-financial corporations, often corporations with uh, lower ratings or below investment grade ratings, and it and it goes on the theory that um, you know. Each individual loan might have a certain degree of risk, but when you collate these loans from across the different from uh, the, the economy, when you take service sector businesses and manufacturing businesses, and you know businesses all all throughout uh, the the real economy, quote unquote, um, and you put them together, um, they're greater than the sum of their parts, and that they're you know you you can be you know you might be facing a retail apocalypse, but the the a lot of the rest of the portfolio is going to behave differently, and you know whether or not you you agree or not, that's this basic thing: is you're taking of these individual corporate loans and you're putting them together into securities. Right. So it's that whole kind of idea that we remember from the Big Short, where they argued that if you put together a whole bunch of junk, then it's it still is junk, but the reality is that uh, the kind of the the rating agencies could kind of take the top parts of that and, and call that non-junk. How is it different from that? Like, why is the CLO different than the old CDOs that we experienced in the 2008 crisis? Sure. One, one element that I, I do think I want to emphasize that I think in discussing structured financial products and discussing these kinds of securities, the rating part has gotten overemphasized because whatever you rate, so that you know, in, in, in these kind of structured products, you have these set of tranches, which is basically just layers. They're like slices of a cake and you're, you're dividing up uh, things into the slices of the cake, and there's kind of like a good slice of the cake. Like you know, the, the you know, if you if you like the corner slices, the corner slice is the best slice of the cake. You know, you're you're selling that uh, that that corner cu- uh, uh, slice with that has that really good crust for more than you'd be <laughs> selling the middle parts. And right, okay. The and whether or not you know someone says this is a five star cake, it's the best cake I've ever had. The crust slice is still better than the middle slices, and okay. so with with these tranches, the important part, what makes them better, you know, there's not there obviously it's not something you literally taste. What makes them better is that someone else is going to take a loss first. That you have these kind of first order people, the people who own the lower tranches, that if default rates really go above a certain level, those people are going to lose all their money, um, and you still are going to get paid um, from the underlying loans. And that's true regardless of whether you know the, the top tranches are rated triple A or double A. So it can be true that these tranches are misrated, but 
they there is a very real protection that's being built in um, from these securities. Now, what happens with collateralized debt obligations is it took that underlying concept that made sense. You took individual loans and then you put them, um, you structured them, a portfolio of them into securities and then sold those securities, um, and it made a Frankenstein out of them. It said, why don't you take the dregs of <laughs> – of securities, take the mortgage-backed securities and take the worst pieces of them, the pieces we can't sell off to anyone else, or uh, um, and let's repackage them as a yet another set of securities. So even though they sound same, collateralized loan obligation and collateralized debt obligation, is, they sound so similar. Both names are so anodyne. They're so similar. Aren't they basically the same? They're actually very, very different, and it's really important to understand that, that the, the collateralized debt obligation is a monstrosity because it's taking underlying securities, securities that if the underlying loans reach 11% default rate will become valueless. And it's packaging them all together and saying, "This is going, this is going to be triple A." And the problem is, there's with with CDOs, they're kind of fake. They, they're giving you the sense, "Oh, someone else is going to take the loss before me," but really, because it's just a uh, it, it's a security that's made up of securities of people who are supposed to be taking the first losses of securities that are taking the first losses. That when the as soon as the economy goes down. Everything is going to be lost on all on all the products. So they're basically, you know, the whole idea of like quote unquote diversification, whether or not you think it gets overused or exploited, it's completely meaningless in the CDO context. Uh, they should never be allowed to make these securities because there is no there is no hedge, there is no protection that you're getting because they're all going to blow up at the same time. You know, with 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 when with underlying loans, 10% default or even 15% default, there's still 85% that won't default. Whereas when you look past the layer of these securities, what you see is underlying loans that are that once they reach a 10, 15, once the economy reaches 10 to 15 percent default rates on mortgages, then all of these securities are going to blow up, and that's what we saw in the crisis. Over 14,000 um, uh, CDOs that were rated AAA um, got wiped out, and it's because th this is not uh, fundamentally not a product that should be made. You know, there's too many layers between the loans and the under and the and the security that investors are holding with uh, collateralized debt obligations. So it's just it, there's too many layers. It's too complex to really see what's going on. And then when you understand the structuring of the product, you realize these are these are basically set to go off. And and that makes them very different. You know, the, so there's you know to recap with CDOs, there's two layers, and that second layer is where you get killed. And with CLOs, there's just one layer. Which is what makes it like a mortgage-backed security. Which you know we you know we talk about how the, how horrible all those products were. Da da da. The triple A rated tranches of uh, the top rated the top tranches of mortgage of actual mortgage-backed securities only took half a percent of loss, which is more than they should have as triple A securities, but is not anywhere near being wiped out the way CDOs were. Right. So the CDOs are almost like. Uh... These these products on steroids, whereas the CLO should behave a lot more, kind of more tamely. Now, the other thing that you brought to uh, to attention in your article is the fact that the market size of the CDOs was a lot larger than CLOs. Why don't you speak to that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, well, you know. First is that the seal uh, is is that since the com proper comparison um, between these two securities is 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 CLOs, collateralized loan obligations, and mortgage-backed securities. Those are really the securities we should be comparing the sizes of. Um, so that's the okay. first layer. And then when you see that, what you get is that uh, is that they were much much smaller. Uh, they're much much smaller. That if you um, in in dollar terms, like just the the actual dollar amount comparing from all those years ago to now. Um, the collateralized loan obligation market is a third of the size of sub of the subprime mortgage backed securities market, and that that even understates it because you really should be com comparing to GDP, comparing to the size of the economy then versus the size of the economy now. And when you do that, you find that uh, collateralized loan obligations are about twenty two and a half percent of 
the size of the mortgage-backed securities market then. So we're talking about we're talking about a, a, a market, the underlying market, the underlying mortgage-backed security market is much, much smaller than uh, the than mortgage-backed securities were then. The CLO market is much smaller now. And at that just first base level, we know that it is much less systemically important. Right. So we have a product that is smaller and that the kind of banks are speculating in less. That should be a lot more tame. And then not only that, we have the response from the Fed, which is much different, right? Uh, could you not argue that this um, this kind of corona crisis has seen the Fed provide whatever liquidity is needed, whereas in 2008, it actually caught them off guard and they were not prepared to provide the liquidity? Yeah, in, in 2008, li- liquidity was happenstance. It was arbitrary. You'd get liquidity for specific projects. You'd get liquidity as like a bridge financing for specific companies to get bought out, which wasn't uh, – which, which uh, Dodd-Frank heavily discouraged in the way it rewrote uh, – the Federal Reserve's emergency powers, um, and it, the, in general, they were just very reluctant to deal with the liquidity issues that were happening in the banking system. It took it, you know, the, they they eventually created in an, an anonymous discount window using the term auction facility to distribute liquidity. But by the time they had done that, the banking system had already been facing severe liquidity is- issues for over a year by that point. Whereas in this crisis, they responded immediately. They bought trillions of dollars of securities. They coordinated with the major banks to say, we're going to break the stigma on the discount window. You're all going to borrow at the discount window at once, and we're going to um, set the interest rate. You know, We're, we're going to eliminate any penalty you get for using the discount window. And not only that, but we're going to provide you term financing. You can borrow um, at the level of at, – for at the maturities that your assets are and basically you know which is the highest form of 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 liquidity protection when you can maturity match your assets um it 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 really went all out on the liquidity sphere and almost immediately as the crisis started whereas it literally took all over a year for the federal reserve really to fully get its out together on the liquidity front um and not to mention that but we've also restructured liquidity markets over the la- over the last decade um switched things from um to uh from to secured financing to from unsecured it's a completely different world, and so the kind of that immediate flash crisis that you get because of liquidity issues is just not something that's going to be happening now. Right, and the other thing in the Atlantic article that they try to kind of sensationalize this is this collateralized um, synthetic obligations. Why don't you explain to us what those are and why those aren't a concern either for the kind of systemic banking issues? Sure. Um, he touched it on it a little bit. I mean, I think partially because what he's conflating um, collateralized loan obligations and collateralized debt obligations, he doesn't have much room to tell us a, a CSO story. Um, one thing is I just think the, C- the CSOs are just much smaller. They only really got going um, in 2014 to make, you know, making, you know, the equivalent of CDOs for CLOs. Um, and th- it's a, it's a, um, much smaller market. The maturities uh, in the, the maturities for these securities are much smaller. They're not rated, which means that there's no big in, um, big investors. There's no there's no um, institutional investors who are investing in these securities because they're um, they're unrated. Um, so and thus also there's no incentive to like opt quote unquote optimize these pools um, to be able to try to uh, earn an investment grade rating or hide and screw around with them. Um, And banks have to sell all the debt and equity in uh, collateralized synthetic obligations, which means they don't retain any of the risks that are, that are involved with them. Um, Sorry. So uh, they're not sitting on the bank's balance sheet. So they're not not because they're not sitting on the bank's balance sheet. That's the main concern he has is that the, the banks are going to blow up like 2008 again. And if they're not on the bank's balance sheet, then what, we shouldn't worry about them. Yeah. You know, as, as Guggenheim investments, I really think did a really good job uh, talking about this earlier this year is um, post-crisis bank regulations have e- either prohibited or made uneconomic the ownership trading and warehouse financing of CSO risk, meaning, you know, they're not, um, they're, it's not it's not profitable to own them it's not possible to trade in them and it's not profitable to like hold them on your balance sheet temporarily where, while you're trying to unload them as a dealer i mean it's just really it's not the same thing and not, not only that 
the, the big ins- the, the other threat is rep and warranties threat basically that you know the threat of you know they people sold securities as something that other than they were and thus you know got um, and thus would have some be on the hook to make back some of those losses. Um, besides which, that that really wasn't a macroeconomic threat for the banking system at the, to- at the time. Um, it's also that the, the whole incentive to defraud is an incentive driven by um, rating agencies. It's you, you defraud in order to get a higher rating in order to unload these securities on quote unquote dumb investors on whales um, who are the institutional investors. And when these securities are unrated, that incentive goes away. There's not, you, you're not getting by and on anyone. You're just assigning uh, a, 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 a customized bespoke deal for someone who wants to take a particular type of, of risk. And your incentive is to just make the fee on that rather than trying to unload risk on unwary you know, groups as it were. So you touched on it, the fact that uh, um, a lot of these kind of products are no longer in, there's no incentive for banks to hold them on their balance sheet and they do own some CLOs. Why don't we kind of touch about like touch on how much they do own and whether it is a threat to their equity and their, their capital buffers. Like uh, one of the things I found really interesting was the fact that you had the the stat about if Citibank was to default on all of their um, credit uh, kind of counterparties, it would only be twenty one billion dollars. And I know you, people say twenty one billion dollars, but that's assuming that everyone defaults. I was actually shocked that it wasn't a much higher number. Yeah, I, honestly, when I went, I um, this was, I mean, you know. All, all credit to partner. I, this was a useful exercise to go back and recheck all the things I wrote, and I was surprised by that number too. They've really, uh, they've really, you know. Obviously, there's some wiggle room there. You know, it all depends on what gets defined as gross positive fair value. But I mean, based on what, what I looked at, at the evidence, it really seems like these parts of the books are have really moved past, and that the central clearing houses, the fact that you you have this multilateral clearing of of derivatives, it seems like it's really gone a lot a lot of the way, and de- especially on the credit derivative front. There's just not the same incentive to participate um, in the credit derivative market in the same way, which makes sense because then you had you know at the time you had insurers, you had be- people like AIG who you could um, who who were willing to take these one sided insurance bets. Um, and you and you could try to unload all the all the risk all at once um, on these players, and there's no player like that anymore. So you know, it, it, you know, when you think about it, it actually does make sense that um, banks are not willing to take big positions in uh, in in credit derivatives because there's you know there's there's no there is no uh, counterparty to uh, take on the risk that would be involved with that anymore. Right, and in terms of the CLOs, they also don't own that many of those, right? Not, uh, not much at all. Yeah, I mean, the, the banks, banks holding of uh, of CLOs is is relatively tiny, mostly concentrated in the triple in in the top tranches, the triple A tranches, which means a lot of other people have to be taking losses um, before it hits them. Which you know, they uh, it, it's it's sort of kind of tacitly admitted in this in 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 this graphic. Um, in part noise piece, which you know, I would encourage readers to take a look at because I think I think it really is does a, it does a lot of the rhetorical work from him. You see this, you know, this graphic where there's little dots that remember that uh, represent each underlying security, and default is represented by these big reds, um, these big red dots. And then you look at the example that he's saying is the worst case scenario, and it's just a sea of red dots, and you're just like, oh my god, look. The, almost the entire security is filled with defaulting loans. Everything's over. You know, of course, these people are going to get uh, wiped out. Um, and it, it, it does, the, that the, the graphic does a lot of the rhetorical work for Partnoy in a way that I felt um, was misleading. Right. So one of the things that you will acknowledge, though, is that maybe the CLOs aren't the concern to the financial system. But one of the issues might be that if we do have a general kind of uh, kind of surge of defaults, then the banking system will suffer. Why don't you talk to us just kind of briefly about what does keep you up? If it's not CLOs, what are you worried about? Um, I'm worried about our general macroeconomic situation. I really think Congress has not, um, not stepped up the way that it needs to in terms of 
um, in terms of fiscal policy. I mean, if you think about it, what what is this fund crisis fundamentally is? At, at the most basic level, the crisis is collapse in income. People are no longer able to sell the goods and services that they need to sell to uh, to get revenue because they can't sell those goods and services. They can't hire workers to uh, produce those goods and services. And you know, on, down the line, we have this collapse in income across the board, um, which Congress has made up to a certain extent with uh, um, supplementary un uh, unemployment insurance benefits and uh, um, give every, giving everyone a $1,200 check and um, uh, payroll protection program loans, um, forgivable loans. But really, it has not – this scale of the stuff isn't anywhere near enough. $500 billion of the headline $2.2 trillion from the CARES Act. CARES Act was um, just to deal with, as I've written about before, this internal accounting gimmick between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, which means it didn't mean income to the real economy, and it just Congress really needs to step on that, a uh, step up on that. We need a massive rush of disposable income to the economy, which means they just need to shovel cash out the door. You know, we need we need recurring twelve hundred dollar checks on a monthly basis. We need you know to, to extend the unemployment insurance benefits, which are going uh, which are going away um, in, in at the end of July, and we need to make those that those tied to the unemployment rate. So they are keep on going out the door until the unemployment rate falls below below a certain amount we need to just we, on all cylinders we need to really get income more comprehensively to the economy and the only way to do that with fis is with fiscal policy and congress is just missing an action and the federal reserve is trying to pick up the pieces and it can slow down our economic problems it can it can provide liquidity so the banking system doesn't just crash it can it can do a a decent amount of things, but it ultimately can't fill that hole in uh, the private sector's balance sheets. That's ultimately something Congress has to do, and Congress is just not stepping up. It does not see uh, the urgency in that task. So um, I, I'm sympathetic to some of those points that you made, but one of the things that kind of my pushback might be that the markets are kind of indicating that their fiscal there is enough fiscal being done right now. And it's actually more of a worry going forward than it is today. What would you say to that? Um, I think the markets are disconnected from what's going on right now. I think the, the, I think first of all, I think there's just a lot of volatility coming from you know we have these massive potential changes to the economy or not changes to the economy that are happening all the time, and I think um, markets are also seem to be making bets based on. Uh, the f based on the future, based on what will happen after this crisis is over, uh, which companies are going to be able to pick up the pieces, and obviously certain companies are going to be able to benefit. So you get this sort of feedback thing where, oh, I think this company is going to get more dominant in the economy um, a year, two, three years from now. Thus, I'm going to buy its stock. We're going to you know, see capital gains in those stocks. The stock market rises, and people say the economy now is doing well, but really people are making bets – one, two, one, two, three, four years down the line, and you, you see short-term, you know, movements based on what's going on um, now. But um, the the kind of long-term structural things that uh, market participants are basing things on are this projection about the future. But I think you know, if the if the economy does fall apart, if Congress really does fail to get unemployment insurance uh, uh, unemployment insurance benefits out the door, supplementary ones um, in in July, I think. I think market participants will suddenly realize that they can't um, look to the future so much. They actually have to focus on right now. Um, and I think so. I think there's just a kind of disconnect uh, between markets, what, what's going on in the markets and what's going on with the real economy. And that disconnect is actually driving uh, Congress's um, blase about about what's going on. Right. Well, that was going to be my question. Do you think that actually it's a victim of its own success? And can Congress do the fiscal that you think is needed without a crisis? Um, politically, it doesn't seem able to. I mean, politically, it's shocking. I mean, we're you're seeing, you know, you saw mass mass unrest, you know, um, mass protests uprising, uh, you know, throughout the country, and Congress seemed to just respond with, meh, whatever. We'll, we'll go in. We'll we'll be in, back in session in a month. Um, Congress really seems unresponsive to what's happening um, in the wider society and the economy right now. It does not seem to really be connected. I think there's this feeling that 
the each each part of Congress thinks the other guy is going to really take the blame for things going wrong, and everyone seems just sort of disconnected from what's happening. So it seems to me that there's going to have to be an immediate jolt that makes people realize that the job isn't done. I also think Congress generally – gives itself credit for doing things that uh, people don't imagine Congress would do or, or do on the scale. So I think, you know, the being able to point to a headline $2.2 trillion uh, quote unquote stimulus bill, um, and that's the biggest that there's ever been, you know, c Congress tends to like um, really uh, pat itself back about the, doing the biggest thing uh, that it's ever done rather than um, the the operating on the scale the crisis actually demands and you know congress does not see it fundamentally does not see its job to respond to the full scale of crisis it sees its job as kind of beating performance expectations well there you go folks we got nathan tank as he's on here he's telling us not only is he great at the plumbing when it comes to cdos clos and all that great stuff and and how the monitor uh, you know modern kind of financial system works but he also gives you some great macro calls so nathan why don't you tell people a little bit about where you write what you do and how they can kind of uh, read more about you sure um I'm a research director of the Modern Money Network, which uh, focuses on education around um, money in the financial system and macroeconomics, especially macroeconomics and law. These two connect topics that are too often disconnected, but really are very related. And um, for the past three months, I've been writing coverage on the crisis called, um, on my newsletter, Notes on the Crisis, which you can find at nathantankus.substack.com. Um, and yeah, that's I, I, that's where I've been writing, and um, I'm producing uh, multiple pieces every week, covering various different aspects of the crisis, and um, we'll be producing uh, coverage uh, full time for the foreseeable future. And you can uh, find a special uh, discount code on an annual subscription um, to. Uh, to my newsletter and get uh, some of the paid content that's uh, behind the paywall at uh, nathantankus.substack.com slash market huddle. So Nathan, I was laughing because I am also a Substack uh, kind of writer. And one of my biggest complaints I have about them is the fact that they don't let us have our own uh, URL and that we can't use our own domain. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, like you have to stick Substack in everything. It's uh, <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of annoying, but otherwise it's a great platform for those who uh, you. And also, if you want to follow Nathan on Twitter, where can they find you? They can find me at twitter.com dash uh, slash uh, Nathan Tankus. I'm I'm there on my yeah. real name. That's terrific. Well, Nathan, it's been a pleasure having you. We're going to have you back on in the summer movie, hopefully to talk about all these great things and to give us a little bit of an MMT refresher lesson. Sounds great. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Take care. Patrick, it's time for Talking Charts. The mumbo jumbo, that? right? Like the mumbo it, jumbo. I, that, was, that was fabulous. Thank you for that wonderful intro. It's, uh, all right, but let's jump into it. What, what I figure, I, I say, well, let's just take a tour of some of what's going on in these sectors, right? Let's just go through um, uh, 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 what's hot and what's not. Because this is, to me, is kind of, kind of fascinating, the story that's happening. So obviously, this, we're starting off with one of the hottest sectors, and that's technology, right? This is the uh, XLK chart. And, uh, and the technology stocks have just been running. And particularly, if you look at uh, one component of it, let's say with the social media um, ETF, SOCL, like this thing just doesn't quit. This is an outright parabolic rise. Uh, and, and every single one of the every dip is bought within two days and then just keeps breaking 52 week highs and just keeps going. I, I actually had not looked at the chart of this. That's like redonkulous. Like right. You can like, just put a, like a, a thing in there. It's like a machine's been buying it from the from the lows. Yeah. It's like it didn't even stop once. It's just perpetually rising. In a, in that's, a, that's actually amazing. I had no idea, Patrick. Right. And what, what's amazing is that this uh, space has really been the, um, the area that got all the tailwind, a lot of the money and the, all the flow. Right. I'm going to like I'll just stay within that space. Like look at the semiconductors. I mean, 
Semiconductors look a lot more like the XLK, which is they're stalling a little bit along their previous highs. Even if you like look at the QQQs, uh, st stalled a little bit uh, along their previous highs. But we have, at least in this basket of stocks, they've all broken the January, February highs. They've all made massive progress, and they have been the market cap bellwethers that have been just driving this entire recovery this whole period, right? And, um, and the, the, the big question is, is this just going to keep going? I mean, we heard uh, from Brad just about that, you know, the, that there's room for big multiple expansion in this phase. And, and it's a lot of these types of names, like the Microsofts, that, that could trade at much higher multiples. I mean, these things not only have been the leadership, but is this where it will continue? I don't know, Patrick. It's a bear market, right, bud? <laughs> I, it is to me. But... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the uh, but this is where we want to uh, kind of look at some of the other sectors. So like look at the financials. So this is the XLF, right? And I mean, uh, we just uh, uh, heard about whether these banks are in the doghouse or not and whether there's real risks to the banking sector. Uh, but, you know, they there's no denying that they, they haven't been able to even recover half of their losses at this stage. I mean, they had a little pop the other week that kind of made it look like they were, but uh, they've given a chunk of that back. I mean, we're trading at $24 uh, dollars on the XLF when the highs were at 32 And it really shows you that the, the index is a bit deceptive because what you'll see as we go through this, there's only a few sectors that are truly leading the way. And there's a lot of, uh, of sectors that are left behind. And the question is, will there be a rotation where that money will start flowing back into these and the market breadth will widen again and, and we'll see a much broader rally? Then I would start being convinced that maybe the bear market isn't here. But really at this stage, it looks like it's just a handful of these stocks that everyone's kind of concentrating into and, and FOMO's driving it. But um, here, like look at the way that the uh, regional banks index just... I mean, it, it's not much of a, a different price than where it was back in April. But Patrick, this is actually what most stocks look like. They yes. grind up and down. They, you know, they break out, they come in and they grind higher. It's that, it's that other one that feels to me unnatural. Like this, just this, that one, like pull that chart up again. It looks like a currency that's trending. The, the social? Yeah. Media? It's like, that just feels wrong. Oh, like, yeah. I, I, and I don't you have know. to, and you have to think that this is going to mean revert at some point. But but the thing is, does do we see? And it's an interesting thing because I've heard it from you more uh, on multiple occasions. I don't want to kind of thing, but I mean, are we going to have a period where uh, where this thing just goes into a parabolic phase? Like, is this a ninety nine all over again where we have sustained higher volatility during a rally? And um, and during that period, a couple of these sectors that are just taking all the money flow just go parabolic. I mean, could we but have the thing about it is it doesn't even feel like when you look at um, 99 and you look at what I what I often talk about is the fact that during that period, stocks became more volatile. But this isn't volatile, Patrick, when a stock just goes up by, you know, uh, 50 basis points every day and never corrects. That's actually a very unvolatile stock. And that's what it's like. It looks to me like this is actually that's why I feel like it's almost. Unnatural. Well, I, I, I think that the, the implied vols that are being priced in the market is is uh, just because no one's going to sell cheap insurance at this stage. I don't right. know whether I don't know whether or not it's reflective of the, uh, the fact that their intraday volatility higher and lower is really high. But anyway, the chart looks like that chart looks like a T-bill that's about to mature. <laughs> no, go. So then. <laughs> You got uh, this is interesting because the, uh, the consumer discretionaries are uh, also back in their high. And now this is I found fascinating because if you told me consumer staples were back on their high, like people need uh, staple goods. But I mean, this things things like consumer discretionary things like uh, autos and airlines and cruise ships and stuff like that are in this basket now I mean yes they're not nowhere near on the upside of this but I mean I well never mind this is just Amazon never mind this is like Amazon is like 20% uh, yeah, of this but Patrick index. I would argue that it's more than just Amazon someone was saying I saw the other day that they were trying to buy a boat and that the uh, boat brokers won't even phone them back because they're so busy 
There's something going on. There really is, Patrick. There's something. Yeah, going everyone. On that... Everyone is wants to get away from the riots, and they're buying a boat. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I <laughs> anyway, think that, but that we've I underestimated how uh, much um, this. The stimulus can. That's the. You know what? Listen, you say a lot of smart things, but that's that's not one of them. That's. <laughs> it, <laughs> trying to tell me that boat sales are up, and that's a. This, a no, forget it. Unemployment I, is still up, right? <laughs> like you do realize I, this. I don't understand. I mean, it's, it, no, no one's I'll using their. It, and I, I, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I don't understand it. It just feels, for some reason, like that the retail is the sub, uh, kind of surprising on the upside. Right. So, and I just, so on the whole, everything is everyone's expecting the economy to collapse, and it's not. And all yeah. I'm saying, and I'm not trying to say that people are taking their stimulus money and buying boats. That's ridiculous. Like that's dumb, right? Like, but th at the same time, I just you can't deny that the market's in some element is going crazy. And to sit there and go, well, it shouldn't be, but it is. No. Yeah. So Anyways. so I want to move on. Right. So the healthcare kind of dropped and kind of been recovering. But I wanted to focus on the biotechs. And uh, this looks like a fresh breakout. And this is one of the ones I wanted to ask. Is this a breakout or is this a, a prairie dog? And to me, this looks like a real breakout. Uh, and, and, you know, when you look at like, uh, let's say Amgen. And the way that it's moving here after like a nice Fibonacci retrace coming to its 52-week highs, the, these biotechs might actually go. And, you know, you, and if you think actually biochen has been dogging it, that's definitely not where it's going. But, you know, uh, we'll be talking about it later on um, in our top three. But like a lot of tension is coming to these biotechs because, uh, you know, everyone's looking for a potential vaccine. So will the, will this follow through? This is definitely a, after a one month consolidation and a fresh breakout. This is a sector to watch. I, that's, that's, I think, uh, though, I'm, I'm not the, to, known to be too bullish. Bullish, but that uh, that chart looks pretty bullish to me. Um, the the other one I just I wanted to touch on this. Like this is the aerospace defense. Like a lot of these spaces, whether it's industrials, aerospace defense, these are uh, these are spaces that have just been dogging it. They can't seem to get off of the mat and get any buying, any traction whatsoever. Uh, you know, the materials index as well, after that gap lower, that, that old stocks went, they were right back down toward their lows. It's like you can see very distinctly which spaces of the market are getting all of the money flow, all the liquidity, and other ones that are literally left for dead uh, on the space. Um, uh, what I also want, like, look at the utilities, like, look at this break, uh, this big bearish engulfing candle today. Just, uh, it, this, this looks like nobody wants to touch this stuff. Even let's say REITs, where do I have the REITs here? Uh, the uh, REITs don't look so not as bad as the utils, but like, anyway, the point I really get across is that there's a few spaces that are hot and a lot that are not. And that, and to me, one of the big puzzle pieces as to whether this is a bull market or whether this is just a, the one most spectacular bear market rally is whether or not the breadth can widen and whether we get some sector rotation that gives a broader rally to this. And that's one of the puzzle pieces I think we have to watch uh, on, on all of this, right? Uh, do you have a comment Patrick, on that? I was just going to say, you keep saying what's hot, what's not. You sound like a stock version of Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Because I think that's what Facebook was <laughs> originally. All right. So, so let, let uh, yeah, exactly. And so let's uh, let's move on because uh, I don't want to go there. And so let's uh, let's talk about some of the stocks like Brad mentioned. So let's uh, talk like, for instance, uh, this is uh, Kirkland Lake Gold, right? And uh, Kirkland Lake uh, obviously got slammed back at the start of 2020. Uh, and this entire consolidation looks like a, a bullish consolidation wedge. A lot of gold miners look at like very similar to this chart. And what's interesting in, uh, is whether or not these gold miners uh, will use this consolidation and break out the way the biotechs just did, right? Uh, are we going to see the next leg higher in this space? And that's interesting because like a, a consolidation like this, like look at what happened with Shopify, uh, and I'll look at the U.S. dollar Shopify here, but this it's literally spent just, uh, you know, a couple weeks consolidating 
and uh, immediately after a bearish engulfing candle, which normally was is considered a reversal pattern that could uh, turn it, it just kind of consolidated within a range for a couple of weeks, and boom, fresh new highs like this. This measures out easily north of a thousand on the continuation pattern on the upside. Like the, the, this is, um, and so the question is, will we see similar style patterns on all of these hot stocks that will just keep running this way uh, along the way? And the final one that I want to leave you with is uh, another one Brad was talking about was Cedar Fair. And uh, obviously it owns that Canada's Wonderland and a number of these other uh, theme parks. And uh, what's interesting here is obviously they got slammed to the downside in, uh, with almost every one of those other stocks associated with large um, congregations of people that are going to have their businesses massively affected, right? But uh, this, is, this looks a lot like every other sector that's been beaten down. Like if, if I overlaid the financials or something over this, it looks actually very similar. It'd be really interesting with when all of these stocks, if, if they can uh, just kind of hold in these consolidations, there could be still room for some of these to go. It is worth watching to see whether these develop. Anyway, uh, that was what I wanted to talk about uh, for talking charts. Is there one that you wanted me to throw up there? That uh, no, that I, 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 uh, I like that, Patrick. It was good mumbo jumbo. Uh, <laughs> good mumbo jumbo. All right, let's move on. Okay, trading this week in trading history. What do you got for us? Well, it took a while for us to get there, but it's time for us to feature. Nathan Rothschild. And, uh, and so I, what I wanted to talk about was uh, Nathan Rothschild uh, and his role in the Battle of Waterloo, which took place uh, this week in history on June 18th of 1815. And so let's uh, first start off with a little bit of history about uh, uh, Nathan. And so he was born in 1777. Uh, he was a, uh, a German Jewish banker and a businessman who would one day become the wealthiest man on earth and the, uh, the richest among the Rothschild uh, brothers. And so he had four brothers and they were all born to a, a, a wealthy family. You know, color me shocked, Kevin. But his, uh, his father, Mayor uh, Amschel, uh, was the richest antique dealer in Frankfurt who had uh, a large network of powerful friends and clients and expanded his dealings, including providing credit, loans, and money management. And one of the most important clients was William IX, the German prince of the state of uh, Hesse uh, Castle. I hope I pronounced that right. You, but, no, uh, you haven't. No. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it right. I just know you haven't done it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all our listeners aren't <laughs> shocked by this. But anyway, yeah. That's so, right. <laughs> so who? He, anyway, he he provided um, uh, Mayor with um, access to elite clients and vast sums of the uh, wealth to manage. But so at the age anyway of twenty one, eager to leave the nest and make a mark of his own, Nathan moved into uh, Manchester, England. Moved to uh, Manchester, England, and he established a textile trading business. And it, uh, here is where he learned the logistics and finance and he would buy English textiles and ship them back to Germany and that, that skill of shipping and making the connections and networks actually proved to be very important later on in the story and so Nathan uh, then moved uh, to London uh, where he made a fortune trading foreign bills and government securities where he acquired invaluable experience in banking and trading uh, during this time England was in a conflict with the French and uh, the, uh, the business market was wildly volatile. Uh, Napoleon's campaign was very expansive, uh, and he made assertions of power across Western, uh, Western Europe, threatening England's national interest. The country felt uh, at a, lo um, a loss of control, and their markets were suffering. Uh, they were losing uh, their overseas colonies and realizing the conflict was inevitable. England declared war on France in 1803. However... As, uh, as the war progressed, Napoleon imposed trade blockades between Eng England and the rest of Europe. Uh, 
uh, and the British uh, troops were running short on supplies abroad. Although uh, selling bonds to the public had certainly raised plenty of cash uh, for the British government, banknotes were of little uh, use in distant battlefields. And this would be the opportunity of a generation for the Rothschilds. Uh, where uh, this international tension was unfolding, Nathan uh, had been shipping gold across Europe, even uh, with a wink and nod from the French authorities. But uh, why would French allow the English gold out of the country? Well, uh, as we discussed uh, last week, mercantile beliefs were in vogue, so French, uh, uh, the French assumed that many outflows of gold from England must ultimately weaken the British war effort, and so they let it pass. And so that made, um, uh, uh, what, that was one of the big blunders by the French, the real kind of like sacre bleu moment. Uh, and so uh, this all came uh, to head in 1814 when British troops under the leadership of future Duke of Wellington, Sir Arthur Wellesley, uh, when he needed to resupply for the battles against Napoleon, the English government officially employed that gentleman, Nathan, in the most secret and confidential manner to collect in uh, Germany, France, Holland, the largest quantities of French gold and silver coins. And uh, these would then be transferred across Europe uh, through his smuggling networks uh, of these Rothschild brothers. Then they would successfully uh, go on to help in the efforts to defeat Napoleon. Um, uh, so yet uh, what made uh, their operation so profitable was that the Rothschild banking dynasty was a, in a u- unique position across Europe, which allowed them to exploit price and exchange rate differences between markets known as arbitrage. And so um, if the price of gold was higher in Paris than it was in London, one of the brothers would sell the gold bills uh, of exchange and then send these to London, where the other brothers would then use it to buy larger quantities of gold. And the fact that they made sizable transactions on England's behalf uh, meant that they could uh, move markets, adding to their profitability. You could say that they were the original OG market makers, right? And (laughs) so um, in addition to gold smuggling and arbitrage, the uh, Rothschilds also handled some of the larger uh, subsidies paid um, uh, to Britain's continental allies. At one point, Nathan had even earned the family nickname of the master of the stock exchange. And so Rothschilds were already exceptionally wealthy. But it wasn't until 1814 when they were able to multiply their wealth. When Napoleon had been defeated, he was exiled to a small Italian island. And, however, it was too small to hold him, and, he, uh, and soon news swept across England, and Napoleon was back in France and de- uh, determined to revive his empire. So Nathan Rothschild figured that England would ha- like once again be engaged in a long, drawn-out war, which uh, he, um, he responded by buying huge amounts of gold coins, that he could, uh, all the gold he could get his hands on, knowing that he would uh, use it in the same way he did before to, to help uh, the English fund all of their war efforts. Um, and uh, and uh, he would get super rich from all of this. Uh, so, you know, financing a war, that's uh, what the Rothschilds could do right before lunch, right? Like it's, it's just something that they were built for in terms of their banking network. Uh, but as for their plans, it took uh, a, a huge turn when the first major engagement in Napoleon's return was obviously this battle at Waterloo. And this was uh, this week in history on June 18th in, in uh, 1815. It was short-lived and decisive battle of, uh, t- uh, that uh, beat Napoleon. Uh, and this was a major problem for the Rothschilds because they basically positioned themselves uh, for a long drawn out war and they were not expecting this to end. But this is the really cool part was that uh, he had uh, such a, a huge network of information couriers that uh, when the battle was actually won, uh, his couriers were able to inform him back in England of the defeat before even their uh, the government the British government knew of the victory. Right, That's and fascinating. So, so basically, he, he was able to have the first edge in the markets. And so what did he do? And so uh, there was only one way out. So he could use the gold to make massive and huge risky bet on the uh, bond market. Uh, 
And so Nathan's gamble was that the British victory would result in reduced government borrowing and it would send the price of the British consuls to, uh, soaring upwards. Uh, and uh, so the, which these were basically perpetual bonds redeemable at, um, at the option of the government. So as um, they continued to rise in price, Nathan kept buying. And despite his brother's desperate uh, uh, pleas for him to uh, realize his profits, Nathan held his nerve for another year. Uh, eventually, it was in late 1817, with bond prices up uh, more than 40%, he sold, allowing for the, uh, the effects of the purchasing power and sterling and inflation, everything like that. He was essentially profitable by over 800 million U.S. dollars equivalent today. It, it was one of his most audacious trades and, uh, and one of the most audacious trades in financial history, and uh, one which uh, snatched uh, that financial victory from the jaws of Napoleon's uh, uh, military defeat. Uh, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll see the Kev, now this is, I just want to kind of pause here because like, notice that he went long bonds and made a lot of money. <laughs> you go short bonds and you, what? Don't uh, make a lot of money, right? Like, uh, I'm not going to say anything uh, uh, too mean, but you should maybe learn from Nathan. He might have a few tips for you on, on this. Yeah, he's right? buying bonds at a discount. That's why he's making money instead of being, <laughs> like, uh, you know, <laughs> buying bonds at 50 basis points, expecting them to go to zero. Anyway, um, so uh, so he go it, it, anyway, Rothschild's, uh, basically one of the the great investors of his time. Uh, uh, you know, um, basically there was a one quote out there uh, saying that uh, if uh, money uh, is the god of our time, uh, then Rothschild is his prophet. And uh, he he was uh, he was quite the trader of his time to the to this day. Everyone still knows that name, right? So Patrick, the part that confused me about this, and I'm still hung up on this. He goes to England. And he goes to Manchester? Like, Manchester, that's like where the Smiths and New Order come from. Like, it's like a rough part of town. Like he, no, but he was he was, he started a textile, right? I, I, I think get that, it. I, 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 I just think like, that... Um, it wasn't I, like he was poor. Yeah. So it's, I was, like, just shocked that he went to Manchester. That was probably the biggest surprise to me. Nonetheless. Good for him. You know what? But, he uh, didn't waste any time, though. Once he made a little, you know, made a little bit of money, he went off and... Uh, Moved to London, swing in London. I don't know if it's swing in then. <laughs> yeah, we, we, I don't know what it was probably, called. It probably, back then. it probably was. It probably was. Anyways, all right, time to. Good, he is he is a good trader, no there doubt go. about it. So it's it's time to move on. Uh, let's uh, get Taylor on here. Taylor, jump on. Hey hey. Very so excited. Uh, so uh, you uh, put together a WTF video for us. Uh, so uh, what what did you uh, come up with this week? Well, we were chatting about some, uh, like, you know, what's going on, really. And, you know, this guy, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, if I'm saying that right. Uh, Grantham, Grantham, Jeremy Grantham. Grantham. Yeah. Jeremy Grantham. Is, uh, <laughs> he did this uh, this interview, you know, and he's this investing legend uh, who's called three previous market bubbles. He called Japan in 89, the 2000 uh, tech bubble, uh, and the 2008 housing crash. And, uh, you know, I don't know if he was trying to do a, a, an Ackman doomsday cry because, uh, you know, he's uh, apparently a notorious bear. Um, but regardless, it doesn't seem like anybody really cared uh, because <laughs> stonks only go up. Um, so why don't you guys uh, check it out? It is uh, a rally without precedent. The fastest in this time ever. Typically, when this happens, you know as well as I do how it ends. Mm -hmm. We've now reached a level where you buy mm -hmm. bankrupt companies, you mm -hmm. issue stock in bankrupt companies. Come on. Mm -hmm. It's usually the sign of, of a bubble. Keep it up for me. Mm -hmm. And the only one in the history books that takes place against the background of undeniable. Uh, economic problems. That's good for me. This is really the real McCoy. This is crazy stuff. The park is open 24 7, 365. <laughs> every decade, every goddamn century. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, that character the Wolf from Wall uh, Wolf of Wall Street is great. 
the Matthew McConaughey. Like he was a little like uh, he he looked a little thin too in that because I think he was doing that movie with the uh, where he was the AIDS uh, guy right at the time maybe I think that's what the movie was called yeah he was the, the AIDS <laughs> the guy AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> are you making fun of me I... no no I'm happy that you watch something other than a rom com. Uh... <laughs> Well played. What is the name of that movie that he did that he won oh. an Oscar for? Dallas Buyers. There we Club. go. Lena hops on and saves me. Thank you, Lena. And oh. he lost some crazy amount of weight. And so then he was in that. He actually went. But listen, Taylor, you did a great job working it in with Jeremy Grantham. Yeah, I, like I don't it. know. I don't know if Jeremy's gonna like it, but I I liked it. <laughs> I thought it was awesome. <laughs> uh, thanks. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's let's go on. All right, Kev, time for the top three things to watch next week. But let's quickly review what we talked about last week. So the first thing uh, we were just going to we were asking about oil and uh, whether or not um, uh, uh, the oil advance was going to stall. And uh, well, it, not really. Uh, it uh, it didn't take long for for oil to to kind of keep edging a little bit higher here. I'm just going to quickly show uh, this is uh, now the August contract, but we almost tried to break to a higher high that the reversal that we saw last week brushed off almost within 24 like two two trading sessions and it's already coming back i think everyone's keeping an eye on this um this big gap uh, traders like to always watch these and uh, and it'll be really interesting to see whether oil can break a little bit to a higher high what's your what any uh, any uh, color that you have on uh, what's going on in oil it continues to call it climb a wall of worry patrick I uh, most people are bearish. I think that uh, people are going to be surprised, and it's going to head higher. Uh, you know what? Uh, I'm I'm bullish oil long term, but I'm I'm in definitely in that camp where I think it needs to pause before going higher, and uh, which probably means you're going to be right. It's. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, I, I still think that there's room for it to pull back, but it's certainly no sign of it right now. So anyway, number two, um, uh, you know, it's interesting because this COVID, uh, yeah, there are second waves and you're always hearing about more of the breakouts, but it really does seem like the market stopped to give a shit. I disagree. You saw today Apple announced that they were closing some stores and that triggered a big sell off in the market and it went out at the lows of the day, Patrick. So I'll take the other side of that. I think the market's starting to you no, know, but I mean worry that, okay, about that's the- that's that's Apple uh, coming out with news. But that's uh, but it's not, when when you hear the headlines of state by state when when some of the you know more breakouts in this state, the market doesn't seem to even move up. Okay, pulse. so we watch it very closely, and I will tell you that the market cares not about um, cases; it cares about hospitalizations. And interestingly enough, you can actually make money on this. If you watch, often you'll get an uptick in cases, but a downtick in hospitalizations. Right. And in that case, what will happen is the stock market will sell off really quickly. And then what will happen is the algos will buy it once they see the hospitalizations go down. The algos right. are trained to watch the hospitalizations. That's the number that everyone cares about. There you go. You heard it from Kevin Muir. All right. Number one, uh, a risk off or a buying opportunity. And um, well, you know what? The, this is uh, I still think the jury's out on this. Like, you know, the one thing I'll uh, pull up here on the S&P 500 is, is that we did get that one big slam candle lower right in here. Right. And it just broke to the downside and we had a reflexive bounce. But so far. Um, you know, it seems to be rolling over. I, I, I'm not saying that I'm uh, that this is all downside from here, but one one interesting thing will be is what uh, in order for really legitimately the bulls to solidify that they're in charge of this market is to brush off that sell off and get it back to highs. The technology space has done it, right? We so we looked at those charts of of uh, those uh, social media stocks and the QQQs, but the broader S and P, like I mean, all these other markets they're um, they're not buying it right now and uh, and so the question is is that is this going to be a more of a prolonged correction is this a beginning of something that's turning it's going to be one of the interesting things to see but the market one of the things i think that's worth watching is whether or not those 10-year tre- uh, treasury yields continue to gravitate lower in spite of your bearishness uh it, 
Uh, but no, but I, what we have seen in the past is is that the uh, drop in yields can sometimes lead the stock market. And so if we, I'm not trying to say it will, but if we do see uh, a break in yields to like 60 basis points or less, then that would you not consider that to be a warning that we are entering some sort of a risk off cycle where the market could give some of this back? Not necessarily, but I am bearish on the stock market. I think it's lower. Yeah. What? I've been that way what? for a while. I've been that way for a while. What I think is hilarious. Brad is will be disappointed in you. I uh, no no. Listen, <laughs> it's, tra- it's a trading call. It's a trading call, and that's, you got to make sure you keep my time frames in place. Yeah. I think that we're going to have a trading correction, whereas you think it's going to be a resumption of the bear. I think we're going to have a correction of the bull, and that's the difference. What I think is the most funny is that when I put out my uh, call that I would go and buy puts and sell twice as many out of the money puts. Yeah, I thought that was you stupid. were so you were so worried about those. You were so worried about those well, out of the so, money. That's just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It only makes me em- it emboldens me that I'm right. At least, at least, just do a straight out debit spread. Like you know what I mean. Like yeah, it, you know me. I can't. Like I don't like paying them for uh, for ball. You know, uh, I'm just I'm I'm cheap that way. I don't like being long ball. I know, but and you know what? That, but, uh, what, now, what fun? What, be, what, what goes now, down? Me, I'm are, not you in least, trouble. are you are you at least uh, are you at least shorter duration? Are you like less than a month on your duration on that? I'm at, like I bought. I was trading July, so now I'm yeah okay July. okay okay. That's yeah. not bad. If you went longer yeah. term, that would be really bad. But uh, yeah, but no, it, I don't think that's a great trade. But anyways, the uh, I am I am bearish for a trade lower. I still think that when you look at this thing, the rollover has started. And it's going to continue. The lows are not in for the correct. I am. I am not going to say anything because every time I agree with you, we gooch or something. So yeah. you know, uh, if you're if you're making a bear call, I'm just going to let it happen. Whatever, whatever you say, I'm not going to add anything else to it. Okay, so yeah. let's talk about the the top three things to watch next week. And uh, and what was interesting and in, uh, was that there's a number of these uh, COVID vaccines trials coming due, and question that becomes. Uh, what if one of them actually has a positive headline? I mean, yeah. do, you, do you think it'll have a, a positive effect on the market or is the market? For just- sure. Listen, this is this is everything. So we have three different companies that have different phase of trials that are due. Um, it's not just AstraZeneca, next week, it's the- I know. And it's basically the next two weeks that we should expect yeah. these to come through. Sometime here couple phase June. one trials and then a phase three trial from REGN. Um Regardless, more and more as we get closer to the point where we should hopefully see some uh, kind of news out of the vaccine front, this is going to drive the markets. Patrick, can you imagine tomorrow if they came up and they said, we have a vaccine, it'll be ready in the fall? I'm not calling that. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But just imagine. All right, I'm done imagining. You want to go move on? (laughs) Okay, sure. What do we got for number two? We could we could have all sorts of little fantasies too. Right? Let's, no, let's be but listen, I listen. I I'm not saying that it's going to happen, and I hope it happens from a societal point of view. And yeah. I, well, I think listen, of think, course. Yeah. But uh, but I, disc- I I I think that everyone that hopes that a vaccine can come, uh, are, I think that uh, it'll be a lot more difficult and a lot longer for a vaccine to come. I I don't disagree, Patrick. But it's not zero. It's not zero. And to be honest, if one did come in, I think it would be incredibly bullish because the uh, I don't think anyone is pricing that in. Everyone is an, in exactly. the opinion like we are that that uh, it's like a, such an outlier that it's That's not why you worth keep, this game. Keep your eyes peeled as these things come through. Yeah, potential for surprise. That's why. But you'll see that in the price through. action on the chart as well, though, right? Anyway, so yeah. number two was uh, will volatility return after the quad witching uh, roll off? So we we had the market kind of uh, pause in here, uh, but we were in the range of where all the major strike prices. Very common, and you, we've had m- many episodes talking about uh, the gamma influences going into a major option expiration, which it has a, a, a strong tendency tendency to pin a market and then when all of that gamma rolls off of dealer books it tends to or at least it opens the window for volatility to return and so uh, what what's your take do you think that things become volatile next week i think they go down whether they go down and that creates a lot of volatility is another another kind of question but i do think we drift lower because we did have that gamma pull 
from the dealers being long and and for those who uh, need the reminding when we, the dealers are long gamma as expiry goes through, there's a pull, a natural pull higher every day. Yeah. They have to buy back some of their hedge. And I think we saw today at the open, basically the, the, the kind of finishing of that kind of gamma pull and, and we're rolling over and I, I suspect we're going to continue to roll over whether right. that means dramatically higher volatility. I don't know, but I think we, we, we head lower. I think volatility is coming back. Uh, yeah. and, that, that's uh, talking from a long. You're you always love volatility coming back because you're long volatility. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. No. <laughs> All right. Let's do number one. And uh, I want to talk gold. You know, I mean, we always bring up gold uh, like every third or fourth week. We we too. But like you know what? Uh, when you look at this chart. After this big push higher in bullion off of that liquidity event, there was every reason for gold to break back down to 1600 and to just mean revert back the breakout. And every single time they tried to hammer this thing, buyers bought the dip. Hammer it, buyers bought the dip. Hammered, hammered, buyers bought the dip each time. And it's gravitating higher. Now, it has not yet broken out. So I do not want to claim saying that it, it's, it's not like the biotechs that have already gone. But is this not the thing to watch next week? Like if this thing goes and rips to 1800, it may not stop till 1900 or 2000. We might see all time highs on gold if, and I want to say if, we break out. Uh, what's your take on this? Do you think, you think it all happens? I can say is from your lips to God's ears? I hope we haven't goochered it. Uh, you goochered it. I I, anyway, it hasn't I broken out say, yet. So it hasn't broken out, but it is things to watch because you're right. It is a long, it's two months of consolidation. We're due. We're, it's due for a big move. And will yeah. that move be to the upside? And what's interesting is that when you go to the gold miners, uh, and, and you look at them, all of them have consolidated, right? Like, um, let's just use GDX as an example, right? Uh, or GDX, it doesn't matter. They, you know, they've spent a month consolidating so sideways, almost like that Shopify chart, right? Like uh, Shopify was a little bit of a shorter consolidation, but all you need is gold to break out and one big breakout candle to ki uh, kick in on the GDX or something like this. I'm not saying it, I'm forecasting it, but if we got this, that might be that starting gun that gets this on everyone's radar and it might just go. And I will uh, not, I will not gooter it. I'm not going to say anything. Okay, I'm, let's not let's leave it alone. We're stopping it right now. Everyone, watch gold. All right. So, All right. Uh, parting words of wisdom. Why don't you read it, Kev? Oh, it's 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 uh, that famous trader Socrates, Socrates. <laughs> Socrates. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder if Socrates tossed around some spoos, <laughs> or, if he, or if he preferred the airlines like Portnoy. Okay. <laughs> so, did you choose this because of me? No. Um, the only true wisdom. Is in knowing you know nothing. It's uh, and I uh, clearly I'm not wise yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess so. Why? Because you think you know something. I I I think I might know a few things, and that means yeah. that I have not yet really learned anything yeah. yet at all. You're you're absolutely correct. <laughs> okay, so on that <laughs> note, let's do the thing here. Okay, so well, that's uh, it for our main show. We appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, we couldn't do this show without you guys, so we appreciate everybody. And uh, I want to thank our guests. First of all, Brad Dunkley uh, from War Talk Capital gave us a great story in terms of, uh, you know, a Canadian success story in terms of the hedge fund. I really enjoyed it. I think it was really terrific, and I loved hearing his market views. It was a lot of fun. Hey, and let's get also, him back here in the post game because uh, I think we're going to get a good story out of him. <laughs> we might do that. And then we're going to have uh, – also, I want to make a big thank – Thank you to uh, Nathan Tankus, who came on the show. And um, Patrick, you weren't there for that, but it was a terrific uh, interview. I promised him we'd get him back and we would talk MMT and all the different stuff, which I know will make you throw up in your mouth. But I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. I think it's a great thing. <laughs> so if you liked something on the show, please share it with your friends. You may never know. The bigger our following, the better chance we'll have at getting, like, let's say, Michael Bloomberg on to ask him why it's called the... Bloomberg Terminal as opposed to just Bloomberg Terminal. <laughs> you see, you know, 
He seems to be like the kind of guy who watches the YouTube so we can solve that mystery. What do you think well, our we we are getting? called the Market Huddle versus That's market true. Huddle. Don't call us Market Huddle. We're the Market Huddle. <laughs> So you can listen to The Market Huddle on all the networks, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. Ring the bell or whatever Lena wants you to do there. I'm not really sure. Follow us on Twitter at The Market Huddle. And we're on Twitter Twitter every single day. And Lena's in charge of that. So if you ever want to chat with her, you make sure you go to there. And that's who you, how you get in touch with her. And please, if you could, rate and review us on iTunes. It helps us out immensely. So, Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna. As well, uh, you can follow me on uh, my website, bigpicturetrading.com. Where can they follow you, Kev? I'm at Kevin Muir on Twitter, and my newsletter is themacrotourist.substack.com. And if you want to see some samples of it, please give me an email at Kevin Muir. At, or sorry, it's not Kevin Muir. It's just Kevin at themacrotourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. After show. After show. <laughs> after show. <laughs> Just leave that in there, Lena. I'm just... Uh, I'm it's one of those words. days. It's one of those days. Those days. <laughs> Taylor's uh, with us. Everyone's here. So we have something to talk about. Uh-oh. Wait, we got to break the beer. Oh, yeah. Sorry. We got to do that. So, um, yeah. I don't know if I'm out of practice, but this seems to have gone to my head <laughs> a little faster than some. It is a stronger IPA. I'd say. Okay. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's a I do not like it. I do not like it, Sam. I am. Oh. Uh, I'm going to give it a uh, <laughs> six. Six zero. That's oh. yeah. what are you? You know, you do realize you rated a sour last week higher than this. Yeah, I would rather drink that than this. This just was like, I don't know. You're Maybe kidding. it was the description. It was the description. All right, no, no, no listen. Your rating is your rating. Whatever. That's, yeah. that's, that's what makes a market. I, 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 that's what makes a market. I'm not going to. Anyway, what do you know? What, 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 what do you got? What do you think, Lena? <laughs> I kind of liked oh. it. Um, it, it. It is a little bit on the hoppy side for me, for my taste, but I would probably give it a 7.9. Holy shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lena, usually we're closer. Like, that's like weird. I know, it, I know. I'm giving it also extra points for being a troll. Oh, oh you know oh. what? I, you're, you're, a, you're a better person than me. Um, <laughs> is that what it is? Is that the hoppiness? Because I don't like it. Is that what? Is... Yeah, it's like that little hoppiness at the end. Okay, that then I, I guess that. I mean, it, it is an IPA. So. Yeah, I know, but sometimes they're not like that strong. Okay, Patrick, what are you going to give it? You know what? I am going to give it a nine point one because it's a little oh, bit God. better than it's a little bit better than the sour we had. I actually like it better than the sour than unlike you. Uh, so I, I I can't give it a lower score than I gave the one last week. So Holy I'm shit. Just we're all over the map. Six, seven, nine, nine. Yeah, nine. but but then they have we're to amateurs. Go. But see, no, no. But see, the thing is, is that you normally drink uh, like Labatt Fifty. Yeah. Right. Second and so I don't, I don't, so I don't no, no, no. But then what you have to realize <laughs> is, is that your score don't mean shit when everyone knows what you drink regularly. Okay. <laughs> I no, don't he, drinks, he drinks Labatt 50 because he gets free lures, free yeah. fishing lures with it. <laughs> the only reason he does it. The great Canadian wiggler. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know what that is. That's a great lure, though. The great Canadian wiggler. We caught so many pike with that thing. It's like this red and white one. It's awesome. The Canadian awesome. wiggler. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, right. you know what? The Canadians, true Canadians, will know what I'm talking about when I say <laughs> about that. <laughs> true Canadians, send us your, send us the Canadian wiggler. You'll know. You'll know. People know about the Canadian Lena, wiggler. put a picture up of the, of the Canadian wiggler. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know yeah, what it is. Of course you guys don't. <laughs> These aren't Canadian. I'm an immigrant. Are you really? You weren't born here? No, but I you know what? That doesn't excuse you. You can still be like you are Canadian. You just have to know about the Wiggler. Is is this and like kind maple of like syrup. a Gen X thing? I Not, don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I have no I, idea. I, and you, and you have to kind of like fishing. 
Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Like oh, it's um <laughs> Yeah, so okay, now we have to find this here. I got to find out we one of our um avid listeners said that I was wholly off base with the dolphins because I was talking about how dolphins are nice. And uh, I'm going to pull up this F, uh, this uh, article and I'm going to read some to you. Everyone loves dolphins. Those playful models of animal wisdom celebrated for protecting shipwrecked sail- sailors can't speak and spending their days frolicking happily in the waves. Movies, televisions, and water shows feature their antics. Okay. But scientists are following a trail of bloody clues, are discovering that dolphins are far from the happy, peaceful creatures that humans think they know. Okay. They practice in infant side. How do I say that, Lena? Help me out. I'm trying to find that word. Where is this word? It's halfway down. Infant side. I don't know. Off it's Scotland. A, there we go. No, I don't think that's right, Taylor. Well, I, I, I'm not looking at the word. I just going from memory here. It, it sounds it that sounds like a dream or something. Um, <laughs> off Scotland, a scientist watched in shock for nearly an hour as an adult dolphin repeatedly picked up a baby in its mouth and smacked it against the water over and over until it sank from view. Like literally, like this is disturbing. First it was prairie dogs, and now it's dolphins. My world. Uh, my childhood life has now been it, turned up. You know what? Now. It's like the coronavirus brought a whole dark side of the whole world into my kind of focus. Do you not agree? Nobody's happy right now. That's what's I, going on. I Nobody's think that happy. is it. I think Even that where everyone's choosing to send us all the bad things. So, you know what? I would rather um, I acknowledge that maybe dolphins aren't as nice as I thought they were. Here I was thinking that they solved, um, you know, saved humans from sharks and stuff. And turns out that they're baby killers. So I, I don't know what to say. Please send us some happy kind of stories is all I ask. Okay, now on to the, the young people. Taylor and Lena, you guys take it away. I like how you just yeah. call us I know. young people. I know. I did say it once and I got in trouble. I did say it once, so someone had to drink once. For those, who- you you have been very good. You haven't said it single yeah. time in this episode. I, I, I mean, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have like shots of gin waiting for every time you use that word. I'm gonna like I'm gonna I, be I don't, I don't use it anymore. I do think it's hilarious though how um, the boomers and then the younger people are very much at odds in, like in the market right now and this Dave Portnoy is like the lightning rod and he's like sitting there criticizing Buffett telling him to have a nap and stuff like that and the two of them are just like <laughs> they're just they just seem to hate each other and like it's kind of funny I just like and, and me as a true Gen X I just sit around like drinking booze watching it all like we are the mopiest generation ever eh Patrick we don't do anything Oh, we don't care about anything we let you know we just, I just mind my own business. Exactly. That's why nobody talks about Gen X. We don't. We're we're kind of mopey, like, and I kind of like it. We're just in between watching it. So I'm. It's because all, us millennials, or aka young people, we just group all of you together. With I know the that's annoying. That is annoying <laughs> when they when you guys group us with the boomers. You're a zoomer. Yeah, that actually bothers me. That is the one thing that we don't want to be known as. I, you know, I, I think it. I. I think every Gen Xer kind of wishes they had one thing going that the boomers had, which was being able to buy a piece of real estate in the 1970s. Like if if <laughs> if every Gen Xer got to, got a piece of that, then they would there would be no complaints. But I would have liked it, the free the free love that summer of free love. <laughs> when I was 19 years old, like you know there was like a terrible <laughs> disease ripping through. Did you have hair community. back then? I did have hair back then, believe it or not. I only went bald like in my 40s. I actually had hair when earlier. No, I don't know what this says about you, but I imagine that your hair, you went bald on top, but you still had a ponytail. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't do that. Oh my God. I did not have that. The, uh, the ponytail. Well, there's, there's a Isn't famous... the Nigerians that do that? Yeah, the Nigerians do that. And they probably are Gen X's. <laughs> That is a Gen X thing. To do. <laughs> yeah, I think they are Gen X. Yeah. Um, I do think uh, that uh, there is a famous um, kind of fin twit or 
kind of, uh, let's just call him a celebrity in the finance world. A celebrity might be pushing it. But anyways, a famous person, and he has what we call the bald mullet. And you will not ever see me doing the bald mullet, which is basically when you're bald up top and then you just let it grow into a mullet in the back. So you got no party. You oh, got it's no. Like, it's like Buffalo Bill yeah. haircut, sort yeah. of. You got no. You got no business up top, and then you just got party in the back. That's not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually. At, at, sorry, my, ahead, at my high school uh, gr- graduation, I was, uh, you know, there's this girl I liked. We're walking down the stairs. The entire gym is full of uh, people. There's like a thousand people in there, and I. I I interrupt her and I go, hey, whoa, stop the story. Look at this woman's mullet in front of us. Like, look at this disgusting, huge, it's like a two foot, like apple can mullet straight down her back. And I was like, look at that thing. And and she goes, that's my mom. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) There's literally a thousand people and I just picked her out. So. Oh my God. You were trying to be funny. And it to be just completely bombed, right? <laughs> that's why you should yeah. never make fun of other people. You always go with yourself. That's and yeah, that's, that's the day right. I learned that lesson. Yeah, that's true. You go with yourself, that's, or that's you can always punch up. That's my other rule. So I'm allowed to make fun of like Warren Buffett or Dave Portnoy because I'm punching up. Oh, somebody way yeah, really big. for sure. You can always you never punch, punch down, up. but that's true. You don't. Yeah. Yeah. You lift up and you punch up. You All lift right. up and punch up. That's the, piece of the lesson of the, the, the signal. <laughs> you don't go after some poor lady in the line that has a mullet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess that was lesson pretty mean. Learned. <laughs> oh, my God. There were so many things that I wish I could take back. Can you imagine me? You think how stupid I am and how dumb things I say. Like, if you took, like, a... <laughs> You took like a whole, like if you just managed to be made a blooper reel of everything embarrassing that I said and ran it over and over again, it'd be like the stuff of nightmares. I would never sleep again. And, and if you cared, you'd never be on a podcast. It's like, yeah, that's uh, true. You're, you're just yeah. publicizing. I mean, every time you talk about stocks, you're always just like. Yeah. Well, bonds, especially, I'm pretty stupid. Yeah, and well, embarrassing yourself. It's <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know what? It but makes you, a lot but of lucky you it don't makes care. a lot of sense lucky to buy. You don't. It's a care. lot. It's a lot of makes a lot of sense to buy a bond with a 0.5 percent yield, hoping to sell to some other idiot who might buy it with a 0.25 percent yield. <laughs> That's called the Fed. Okay, so listen. <laughs> let's uh, let's let the young people talk, Patrick. You guys take so, over. You guys talk about something interesting. <laughs> That's quite. That's that's a great setup. Thanks for uh, leading us into, into that. Well, that's, uh, oh, t- Taylor, like, I, I was thinking you should uh, take um, uh, Portnoy's uh, technique. There was just a headline of him just recently uh, doing a, a playing a game online where he would use Scrabble uh, letters to pick a stock. And so he would literally go and pick just letters out of a thing and pick it, and that's the stock he's going to push. What do you think of this? Is this a good uh, investment strategy? I mean, they, they did that with monkeys, right? Throwing darts. Oh yeah. I I mean, this is uh, you know, he's if he broadcasts it, he can do whatever he wants. Like you know, there was when when uh, when crypto was really big, like there was this explosion on Telegram of just like these groups that would just um, you know target a target a, a a little crappy coin and then just run it up. Um, so, you know, of course he'll, he'll be making money because whatever he picks, he'll just say, and then everyone piles into, and that's the way it's been. <laughs> right? So. Like the, It's crazy. It's, uh, it, you know, it, it really comes down to it's just about liquidity. It's about the fact that if you can just create an environment where there's more buyers than sellers, you can drive price action any way you want. Some sucker is going to get stuck holding the bag every time, right? Every time. It's going to be the boomers. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's let the, let's let the young people talk, Patrick. You got involved there. I'm done. I, I'm done. I had I had try, I had so elegantly like thrown it over to Taylor, and then you I'm gonna go like, get another beer. You guys keep talking. You, no, I think Patrick thinks that he's. I know he he's so used. <laughs> guys, like you know, like he. But I think we he's need like to bring a, a year and a half younger than me. Kind of. Why are Why are you age. still talking, Kevin? Yeah, you're right. You you're right. Okay. Okay. Go. Go, guys. Go. <laughs> I think we should bring Brad back to tell us the story about Santa's village. Okay, we can do that. Lena wants to go. 
Everyone have a great weekend. It's Friday night. We got to go. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Right, cheers. And stick around to yeah. find out, you know, why the greatest uh, kind of, I don't know how to describe it. What, do we, what would you call Santa Village, uh, Lena? Oh, I don't know. You can't describe it. You just have to listen to okay, it. Okay, there you go. I won't even try it. In GTA yeah. or be a Canadian. Okay. What do you mean? Ed Harris went up so. there. Really? <laughs> okay, oh. Catch you later. <laughs> okay, see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>Okay, so we brought back Brad because we just found out that he owns or he bought Santa's Village. And for um, actually, interestingly enough, I think that Ed, uh, Ed Harris, uh, Harrison from uh, Real Vision, he came up and when he was in Toronto, he went to Santa's Village. It is a, just an iconic little kind of amusement park that's up in the cottage country. And Brad, you're like my hero, my family's hero. You saved this amusement park and you are like doing great things for hedge fund managers everywhere because you're making us look like good people because you actually own Santa's village. Tell me about it. How did this come about? Okay. So uh, I grew up in Aurelia, as I mentioned, I went there as a kid. I have great memories there. Really is not that far away. And when I was a co-op student at Glasgow Chef, um, I went to CDAR, like it's like the SEC site to get company financials. And Santa's Village used to be a public company. It was built in 1955 by 400 shareholders. The community got together and built it, and it was a publicly traded corporation. And I was what 21 or something at the time, and I said, "Well, geez, like this thing's too small to be public." And hey, maybe I could buy it one day. It's not that expensive. I think it was like a 2 or $3 stock at the time. And so every four or five years, I would check up on it, usually when I was looking up a stock that started with the letter S. And uh, one year, I was on the letter S, and it was gone. It had been privatized, and I had a bit of a panic attack. And I wrote a letter to <laughs> – I wrote a letter to the general manager. I said, look, I don't know if you still have you – know, I don't know who bought it, but if, if you have any shares, I'd love to buy some. And and I went up, and I, I met with the – the guy who uh, uh, who was a controlling shareholder, and and uh, we hit it off. And I tried to buy some shares, and somebody else outbid me because it was part of the shareholders agreement. Anyways, but then in a few years, he was ready to retire, and he called me up, and so uh, my wife and I bought it. And um, uh, my wife's an entrepreneur; she runs uh, some other businesses, and she's really involved in running Santa's Village today, and loves buying the rides and doing the designing and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it's been it's been one of the most fun investments we've ever made and it's involved the whole family and, uh, and it is iconic. It's, it's a treasured place and we're happy to have made the investment and lots of good things coming down the road there. That is awesome. You know, I, I, I love that story. I was just telling you that I have, um, uh, some, my wife has some, our kids are too old right now to go to Santa's village, although they probably would like it because they remember many summers going there. We had a cottage near there. We used to go every summer for, uh, you know, we used to boat there and park it and then go see Santa's Village. And it was just, it was something that some of my best memories with the little people and uh, doing all those things. And I'm looking forward to taking my wife's, uh, her, her sisters have had babies recently. And when they get old enough, I'm going to take them there. And now I can say I know the owner. Oh, well, let me, let me know when you're going up. Maybe I can meet you there. And for your older kids, you know, we've got go-karts, batting cages, zip lines, aerial parks. So, you know, you're never too old for, uh, for Santa's Village. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming back on, Brad. I really appreciate it. No problem. Have a great weekend. <laughs> take, Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>